Knock him out. Oh, <laughs> All right, everyone. All right. Can I get everybody on the hallway? Come on in. Please tell the folks in the hallway to come on in. Help us. We're getting ready for the sports spotlight series. Come on in. Before we make an official announcement to start and kick this off, I want to I want to have the vendors that come on over and just share a little, share a little bit. Welcome, everyone. This is exciting. Are you all enjoying yourselves? Yes, yes. So I am Dr. Angela Allen. I am representing Arizona State University and Banner Health. For many of you all who are not familiar with the largest healthcare system in Arizona. And what I wanted to share with you is the Center for Healthy Aging. We have heard some phenomenal speakers who talked about brain health. So what we'd love for you to do is visit our vendor tables. One particular table that talks about before the coin cough. And the main thing I'd like for you to understand on this is discover more about your brain and help build healthy minds for life. So we're encouraging you to stop by our table, obviously take your phone, scan over the QR code, register, and more importantly, we are all about preventive medicine, right? 
We are very familiar with that term. Our former President Obama talked about that, right? So we want to prevent some of the things that we are being acknowledged today. So again, come and visit our table. We have our staff, Dr. Kuhn and the staff, and we are encouraging you to be there. Thank you. And we have presence in the app. Look, up, look, up, look us up on the app and make sure that all those viewers that are on site, many of you I don't know me, I love talking as you can see. So all our viewers on site, please, we ask you to look us up on the app. Once again, Arizona State University Center of Aging. And again, it's the Precision Aging Network. Thank you. Oh, please. Hey, everybody. I am Marcy Ross. I am the head of Alliance Development and Public Policy at Harmony Biosciences. We are a small but mighty pharmaceutical company that is entrenched in rare sleep disorder space. But in corporate affairs, we are very focused on our culture and who we want to be, not just on paper, but in our heart. Our tagline is, patients are at the heart of everything we do. So I wanted to share with you two funding opportunities, or one that may be um, important to you. If you're a researcher, if you have a nonprofit, we have a funding opportunity called Progress at the Heart. And this funding opportunity is rooted in community. It's rooted in underrepresented um, communities who have um, challenges in sleep health or rare sleep disorders or rare neural disorders. So you're, if you're in this space, um, I encourage you to apply. It's not a grant, so no worries. You don't have to fill out a lot. It's an application. Um, so if you have a nonprofit or non-for-profit um, business, we encourage you to come over to the table and learn more about our company and more about this program. We're so excited to be here. Thank you for allowing us to um, experience this with the culture and with the community. And I can say that I've received funding from that organization so to do some research. So believe me, they really do care. They really out there. Now, as you can see on the stage over here, there are no men up there. That's right. Come on. So you, I want you, Bryce, well, what are they doing at a Black Men's Brain Health conference? Well, just wait and see. That's all I'm going to say. We're going to turn this over to Sister Deb so she can do her thing. Testing, there we go. So good afternoon, good people. It's been a wonderful day and a half with the Black Men's Brain Health Conference. And I'm very, very blessed and honored to start our first panel with this Sports Spotlight series sports spotlight series. And what we want to do is bring in those folks who's been there, done that, and got the t-shirt. As in they are champions, they are leaders. And they lead on and off the court, off the track, off the field. And so we want their perspective in terms of the life course of the athlete and thinking about their journey, sharing their journey, sharing their perspectives and how they've worked with young people, people their age and older, and people that are women, people that are men. So we want to bring this into the conversation. And so on this slide and also on your WUVA app, you have a very good uh, bio of these incredible women. So I don't want to take more time going through your bios and your intros. Let's just get right into it. And so my dear friend, Bev Kearney, uh, six-time national champion, in track and field as a coach at the University of Texas, uh, author of an amazing book, uh, Pursuit of Dreams. And also she is currently working with people all across the country to share her journey and help them to be better at what they're good at. Thank you. Coach, coach Sheila Burrell. Uh, she is, I guess what we all dream of one day is to be able to run fast and outrun all the kids in the neighborhood. And so her field is track and field and cross country. And not only does she coach women, but she also coaches men. And she has a very, very accomplished career from an elite athlete to Olympian. So Coach Burrell. 
and Coach Adair, who I just found out is my sorority sister, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> she is the head coach here at the Arizona State uh, University Women's Basketball. So we share a career in women's basketball, just an amazing leader. So I wanna start off by just asking you all to share your journey as an athlete and a coach. And I'll start off with you, Coach Adair. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you so much for being here, taking the time um, and investing. Uh, it's important. And so um, just, I don't even know where to begin. It's been a long journey, very exciting journey. Um, I started playing basketball when I was when I was young in high school, grew up in Washington, DC. And where sport has taken me, the journey, uh, the experiences. Uh, I played at the, the University of South Florida in Tampa. And then upon graduation, I majored in communications. And I didn't think I was gonna be a coach, uh, but I knew I was gonna be in sport. I thought I was gonna be an ESPN broadcaster. So who knows? We'll see. I throw that out there. Um, but along the journey uh, of playing, and um, you learned about yourself, you learn about adversity, uh, you learn about just who you are in, in, in life's purpose, your life purpose. Uh, and, and I knew immediately mine was to serve. Uh, I knew that at a young age, I knew that uh, I was a leader on my team, I was a captain on my team. My nickname was Grandma, you know, so that just tells you I, I just really cared about one another, but don't be fooled. Grandma was tough, right? You think of all your grandmothers, they're tough. Um, but it was about building people up. And so once I graduated, I had an opportunity to work in development at the University of South Florida. And that's where I first learned about just the importance of connection, communication, understanding the behind the scenes of what goes into making sure our student athletes have what they need, building a program, building a successful program, but also knowing um, those moments when I sat on the golf course and watched deals be made, knowing how um, they were made and knowing about the, the power players in the room and the conversations and knowing that I needed to be in that room one day. And so building that at a very young age and being aware, asking questions, not being intimidated if you are uncomfortable, um, step out and, and trust yourself, understand your mission, your purpose. And so I was able to have an opportunity. I, I ran into uh, a coach that actually recruited me out of high school and he came up to me and said, you know, what are you doing now? How have you been? I have an opportunity, but that speaks to relationships. You never know about that first impression. I didn't even pick his university, but there was a connection that we had years prior to, to then fast forward, you know, years later for him to offer me this opportunity. Fast forward that I was an assistant at Georgetown University for six years, went on to Wake Forest University for eight years, became the head coach of the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina, the first black coach in any sport in 2012, was there for two years. Thank you. Was there for two years, broke 22 school records in the first year, but most, most importantly, it was the conversations of the young women, the seniors, especially when I said, what do you want in this experience? They said, coach, we wanna win. And I said, you're gonna to have to work harder than you've ever worked before, but if you meet me there, we'll get there and we'll do it together. And that just kind of, everything just has moved super fast after that. I went back to Georgetown University and was the head coach there for three years and uh, had the second best turnaround in division one after year two. Um, so again, going in and understanding my mission, my purpose and, and uh, after that, um, I got a call to be the head coach at the University of Delaware, um, was there five years where we won two championships. I have former players in, in the audience right now that, that won that championship ring, um, but just, again, another journey to where uh, lifting people up, young people up, and, and just accomplishing dreams that they never could have imagined. And I'll tell you, when I got the call to come here and be a Sun Devil, it was like a dream come true. Uh, I will tell you the warm weather helped, um, but 
it was just the progression in my career. Um, I want to be able to check off all the boxes and to be able to say, I've done it here, I've done it here, I've done it at this level. And, and now uh, this opportunity in the Pac-12, the best conference in the country. Um, and I am the head coach and, and I'm excited to see the next box that I check off. So very grateful for this journey and uh, excited to see what's next. Thank, Thank you, Coach. Coach Burrell. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? So I am currently the director of track and field at San Diego State. I've been there for 14 years now. Um, my story is that from the young age of 12, I'm that young kid that's sitting on the couch watching the Olympic Games for the first time, having never run, didn't play organized sports. I was just a tomboy. Whatever the boys were doing, that's what I was doing. They playing basketball, I'm playing basketball. They're running the street, I'm running the streets. Uh, they jumping over stuff, they're jumping over stuff. I'm, they're breaking bones, I'm breaking bones. We're all doing the same thing. Um, at the age of 12 years old, uh, sitting in my grandmother's living room, I saw my first Olympic Games on TV. Uh, that was Evelyn Ashford. That was um, Valerie Briscoe Hooks. You know, that was uh, that was Flo Jo's bronze medal, I think. Um, and it was my first time seeing the Olympic Games. I had not played organized sport at all. I just knew I loved sports and I was good at it. Uh, and at that point, I knew I wanted to go to the Olympics. That's the first thing I said. I didn't tell anybody. I said, you know, I, I, that's, what, that's what I'm going to do one day. I'm going to do that. That was the first time for me as a young girl at 12, having seen women on TV playing sports. And so I knew I loved athletics. And I also played basketball and other, other things as I went through high school. But track and field was the only thing that I visually saw that if I wanted to be a professional at anything, if I was to be a professional athlete, I can only be a track athlete. There was no what there was no WNBA when I was uh, growing up. There was no uh, volleyball. I played volleyball. There was no you know beach volleyball. There was no Olympic volleyball on TV. And so from that point on, I got involved in club sports. So athletics guided my has guided my life and still guides my life now. I'm a young girl who was raised by my grandparents, my grandmother, my grandfather, my mother. My mother was my mother was a drug addict growing up, and so she was away. So athletics saved my life and guided my life and shaped me tremendously. Um, and the thing about athletics for me as an athlete and now as a coach, the most, you know, I can tell you my story, but I think the most important thing for me in this journey is the people who have influenced and impacted my life along the way. Um, I just got this award the other day about, you know, from my work at San Diego State and made the comment that coaches are important. As a young athlete, kind of going through high school, went to college, went to UCLA, ran for Bob Kersey, trained with Jackie, was recruited out of high school by Gail Devers, you know, was around uh, track and field at a time when we had, I don't know how many Olymp Olympians running around at UCLA on the track at one time. And I still, because of my childhood stuff, was still trying to figure out, figure my way out through college and post-collegiate and how to become an elite athlete, professional athlete. Um, but track and field or sport in general, not just me, I can tell you there's so many other young women in particular during that time where it has given us, given me the opportunity to travel around the world to learn. But the most important thing is what I was saying is that the people who impacted my life along the way, um, I never looked up to and admired a celebrity, a, another athlete, I, you know, I was never that athlete. I was like, oh, I got to get somebody's autograph. I'm not easily impressed. I don't want, I don't, need, I don't need autographs. I was always impressed with and looked at people who were close to me, my coaches and my teachers. My teachers taught me so much stuff, so, so much. My coaches exposed me to so much I was not exposed to. So it was exposure. So athletics and the people who poured into my life exposed me to more than athletics. So I was a good athlete. You didn't have to teach me, you know, go run. Okay, I'm gonna go run. But it was the other things on how to think and how to see and how to perceive and how to perceive uh, a life for myself that was different from my current existence at that time. That's what athletics did for me. Is it a lot, gave me the opportunity to have people who would not have otherwise paid attention to me to pour into my life. I was a shy kid. You know, I was shy when I was, I'm not shy anymore, but I was shy when I was growing up. So I was fast. So I got picked for football. You know, I was a teacher's pet all that stuff because of athletics. I'm the person that will say this, that 
my first job, my first coaching job on my own was at Georgetown. Before I was uh, an assistant's assistant, a volunteer assistant, you know, I'm, I'm a volunteer assistant, I'm assistant assistant. My first job where I was not somebody's assistant, I was my own, my own boss. I was the men's and women's sprints, hurdles, jumps, and throws coach at Georgetown University. And that was my first job on my own. And I got that job. I just retired from being an Olympian. I got that job. I know because I was an Olympian. Because I had name recognition. Because I had, I was only an assistant's assistant. The thing about it, though, is that when I got the job, I applied for several jobs during that time. I applied to Harvard, Tennessee, Maryland, got opportunities to go to other places. But I took the job at Georgetown for this reason. As a young, as a black female at that time, former Olympian, people assume that if you're an athlete, you can't always coach. So I had to prove that I can coach, for one. You know, I studied, had a good, a good coaching mentor, coach. Two, at that time when I got hired, uh, there was a diversity play. They were hiring a lot of black women to make sure they can cover their staffs. You know, you need a, you need a, you need a, you need a diversity, hire a black female, cover the job, you're going to push some paper. I was not pushing paper. You know, I just, you know, I'm a two-time Olympian. I've won five national championships. I'm a medalist from a world championship. I had a work ethic. And so I took the job at Georgetown on purpose because I wanted to prove one that I could coach. And so whenever I left Georgetown, no one could ever say that Sheila Burrell, a former track, a former athlete, could not coach. And I wanted to prove that I was smart. Um, I got my degree in English literature, uh, a minor in history at UCLA. Uh, never used my degree, maybe once. <laughs> I use it. I never, never actually had a job using my degree, but, you know, it comes in handy. <laughs> Uh, but I wanted to prove that whatever I did after this job at Georgetown, that I could, I could do it and no one would ever question my ability. Within my second year at Georgetown, I was named the men's mid-Atlantic regional coach of the year in two years, turned the program around, recruited the most young black track and field athletes at, at Georgetown than they ever had. <laughs> uh, true story about this experience as a coach in this space as a female coach. I'll leave it at this. I was at Georgetown. Tell us about Georgetown. At Georgetown, I got to Georgetown, and you only recruit smart kids at Georgetown. That's just, you know, you can't get in. You got to get into Georgetown on your own. And so I recruited a young, lot of young black men, a uh, lot of, uh, you know, I traveled back and forth. I was sick traveling because I was recruiting because it's my first job. I got to do good. And um, recruited a whole bunch of young black, intelligent kids from good families, some single family homes, got to Georgetown. And it was very interesting, and I'm going to turn over this. This is, my, this is not my ethics, this is my story about coaches and how important they are. Um, it was very interesting that that group, of, that, group that, I, that I recruited, I'm still in touch with them, got in trouble nonstop because they were together walking around campus laughing. They were laughing, so they were being boisterous. Uh, I got in trouble because I would go into an indoor track, Ahern, and the, the guys who ran the company, ran the, ran the, the gym, said that this coach from track and field walked around like she was somebody. So I had to go in and apologize to the director of, the, of, of Ahern because they didn't really appreciate the fact that I knew everybody there, was nice to, all the, nice to all the people who worked there, front desk folks, but somehow this coach walked around like she was somebody. And I had to let them know that I was somebody. So I didn't change my demeanor, but every single athlete that I've coached, whether, you know, I said this recently, I'm not, the, I'm, I won't say I'm the best coach. This one right here is the best coach. This one right here is like, she's, she's one of the coaches I looked up to, you know, as a young coach. This woman's a great coach. I'm an okay coach, but I'm a good coach because I coach athletes to be better people. And so coaches, if you're an athlete or you have parents, you have your parents, your kids are athletes, coaches are important because especially ones that impact and change your athletes' lives. Thank you. Thank you. The Bev Kearney, please tell your Hello, story, everybody. your journey. Can you hear me? On my turn? Okay. All right. They said talk closer. So I'm going to talk closer because I have a I have an outdoor voice. There it goes. So I am what you would label a servant warrior. My undergrad was in social work, but I grew up in the hood, meaning that Spades wasn't spades. Bid whist wasn't just bid whist. My mother would gamble with us every Sunday growing up. 
and she take our lunch money. And she wouldn't give it back. Like you go the whole week just hungry. And we go and I challenge her again, we get our lunch money. And our Sunday fun time was after dinner, sitting at the table, gambling with my mother who gambled in the back rooms for part of her living. So we should have known better. But what that taught me was, one, to not use all my money and let her take it. So I keep like half of it and gamble the other half. But two, it taught me that there were, that I could handle the consequences. And we fear winning and losing because we fear consequences. I have no fear because I was taught that through how I grew up. I didn't come through as a regular coach. I wanted to do something else. I got into coaching because I needed to buy time after I graduated from Auburn University in order for me to, because I was homeless in high school. My whole senior year, I spent in a car. And I'd sleep and I'd go shower in the gym and I'd go home because my mom died my senior year. So out of the seven of us, I was at the bottom and everybody else was gone. So we all kind of like fend for ourselves. And um, I became a head coach at 24 years old, one of the youngest in Division I men or women in history. Over time, I became the first Black head coach at the University of Texas. I became the youngest and one of the first Black head coaches in any sport at the University of Florida. Other than John Thompson, I'm the second one black coach and the first female to win a national championship. And I've won seven. But Thank you. I've won all type of awards. I've been on all type of platforms. And I never won an award or got on a platform because I sought the award. I sought the excellence. And if you seek excellence in all that you do, everything else comes with it. When we talk about athletics, when we talk about sport, it's the people. And people would ask me, how are you still so driven? I turned 65 on February 25th. And I'm still passionate. Why? Because there's somebody out there with a dream that hasn't hit it yet. And if I can do anything that moves that needle towards that vision, that's my passion. That's my goal. So I've coached at the University of Toledo, Indiana State. I've got a master's degree. But I'll tell you, the main thing that I've learned from athletics is, is that there's nothing and no award like seeing the face of a young person when they've accomplished something they didn't think they could. And you pour into people. So when you meet a coach or you meet an athlete or you meet just a person on the street, one of the things I always try to do is I hope that once they pass me, even if it's just a hello, like my new friend here, I genuinely felt his love when I, when I met him. The young man here genuinely felt the love when I met him, but I can't feel what I don't give. So I walk into every room with two things. I walk in as a servant full of love and I walk in with it as a warrior, ready to, ready to throw down. However you want to bring it, I'm ready. That's the fire that's in me. Don't misunderstand both because they, they coexist in a place that every athlete and every coach has to possess. If you don't love what you do and who you are, you can't help someone else love what they do and love themselves and who they are in their space. Thank you. Wow. I have so many questions just based off of your stories. The first one, I would love for you all to speak to what I find to be this either or proposition for young people, as in you've all been very accomplished as elite athletes. And I'm thinking about young black boys and this, it's seemingly this idea that 
you shouldn't do sports because you can't do well in school, or you shouldn't do sports because you won't be able to do X, Y, Z. I believe that you can have it all. You can do it all. So please speak to that sports is something that you can go for. You can be that elite athlete and you can do other things as well. Coach. I have a quick story. I hope you guys don't mind. I was 28 years old. I was hired as the first black head coach and the youngest head coach in the University of Florida's history, right? It was predominantly all white. The one thing they asked me during the recruiting process is, can you recruit white athletes? I said, it depends. They said, it depends on what? How good they are. If they can't help me, no, I can't. <laughs> That's the bottom line. So they also told me that don't bother to recruit black athletes because they will not be academically astute enough to cut the mustard at the University of Florida. Now I'm not talking Yale, Harvard. I'm talking University of Florida. This was actually said to me. So being the warrior that I am, I went out and recruited a whole bunch of them. And the first meeting we have, I'm the youngest person in the room, right? Football's in there, head football coach, head basketball coach, tennis, national champions, et cetera. I'm 28 years old. At the end of the meeting, the AD says, are there any questions? I don't know why my hand went up. I was like, put your hand down. It was too late. It was already in the air, right? I said, who has the highest GPA? Shut up, Bev. I'm not talking to you. And I just kept talking. I was trying to tell myself to stop talking, but I couldn't help it. And they said, well, that's tennis and that's golf and gymnastics are usually the top three. I said, we'll win it. I would tell you they gave me the decency of laughing at me, but they didn't. They just looked at me like, she's stupid. She ain't going to make it here. We set the record for the most all academic athletes off of one team at the time when we were winning. At the University of Texas, we had the highest GPA. I won it at Florida three times. We won it every other year, if not every year. We were always in the top three top academic teams in the country. You will be who the leadership decides your arena will be. We decided on excellence and excellence has no place. If you're excellent in one, you can be excellent in the other. It's the same work ethic. I have no fear of a job. I worked in a cleaner's cleaning laundry. When I was young, I would have to jump up and pull the press down. Still got burns on my legs from hitting the press. And I always thought, if I can do that in the heat of, in the heat of summer in the, at, at, in the state of Florida where I grew up, I can do any job. And that's the thing I try to instill in all my athletes. The perceptions don't matter. The reality of what you're willing to do and who you believe you are is all that matters. And the people that are closest to you help you set that narrative. So I would tell everyone here to don't listen to the bureaucracy or even the statistics. Become the statistic that you want to be because you get to decide that. I decided on greatness from the very beginning. If I'm cleaning up, I'm going to clean to the best of my ability. You won't be able to eat off the floor unless you're nasty, but you can pick it up real quick and not have a lot of germs on it. I can make you that promise because I'm going to give it my best. And that's the way I try to teach. Well, and, and to speak to that, um, I have another story as well. Aside from, obviously, my parents who uh, instilled just this confidence in, in my brother, sister, and I. Um, I remember moments where I was on the court, the basketball court, and, and at that time, there weren't many women playing. And I remember going and, you know, it was that, that one gentleman or whomever that says, well, I don't want to guard her. <laughs> so, you know, I chuckled because you know who I guarded, him. Um, but I think what, what gave me the confidence was my father there, my brother there saying, no, you guard him. You do it. And if he blocks your shot, get back up, get back up, get back up. I was always told to get back up. Um, but another another story about the people in your lives, 
um, my college coach, Trudy Lacey, who is recognized in the African American Museum in Washington, D.C., as the first African American WNBA general manager and women's basketball head coach. That was my college coach. So to tell you those conversations that I had as a player, not only does representation matter, it gave me an opportunity to see someone who looked like me have success, but also give me permission and reassurance that I could do it too. But she would have these conversations about the importance of not just being a student athlete, that you have a responsibility not only to excel in the classroom, on the court, in the community, you have no other choice. You, it's not optional. And to have that at a, at a very young age, but to also see her on her bad days, to go in her office and see her, her head in her hands and wonder what's going on. She said, you have no idea the fight. You have no idea the struggle. I need you all to have a good day. I need you all to help me today. And that fast forward, that has stayed with me, that I still have that responsibility to have those same conversations, to be that example, to be that leader, to pick myself up and to let everyone know that there is an expectation there is an expectation and a responsibility to be your best, to push past all obstacles and know that you can. And every day, that is my mission. I, I, I had this, this coach of mine, coaching friend, talk about the, the trophies that we chase. His name is Kevin Sutton. He said, we ultimately as coaches want that, that national trophy. And yes, we do. But it's life trophies. It's living trophies that we have in our student athletes. And for me, 25 years in, to have my former players on my staff, to have players that are all in all walks of life, homemaker, teacher of the year, w, WNBA, uh, five WNBA championships. Now she is on the staff for Becca Brunson. Her jersey was retired. This is why every day I get up because I remember the conversations from my mom and dad that said, get up, but also representation of my head coach, Trudy Lacey, who every day said, it is your responsibility to get it done. Coach Burrell? Um, I think I'll, I'll speak to your question about keeping young men um, involved in sport. It, it depends. I, I be, in my experience, I don't think that our experience as, as African-Americans is, is the same for everybody. People grow up in different socioeconomic backgrounds. People come from different families. You know, you could have, uh, you know, biracial family. You can have two black parents. You can have people who are, you know, middle class, who are, you know, low income and people who are, you know, wealthy. And so we all come to, to sport from different experiences. And so on the base level, you know, I've seen, you know, traveling at the Olympics, I've, I've been around a, a thrower who was just, you know, I was at the Plains Training Olympic, Center, Olympic Training Center, and he was just, he was a thug. And he didn't go to jail because he had to go to practice. Like, he told me this story. I was on my way, whoop de whoop do this, do that. But you know what? Coach said I had to be a practice. So he left what he was doing and went to practice. And for him, athletics and sport saved his life, Right. Then you got the other side of it where there's a kid that's, you know, that's a, it's a good, a good young man. He's a good kid. What do you have to do to, in order to stay eligible to play sports? You got to get good grades. So, you know, having a good GPA teaches you and forces you to be disciplined that you have to study in order to get good grades. And then if you don't get it, there's some discipline attached to that. And then you have the other side where you have that kid that like my Georgetown kids who come from decent families and not all of them came from decent families. Some came from low income camp families. They're on like, you know, uh, first generation that are at Georgetown and they're mixed in with these kids who come from people, parents with money. When they all got to, got to Georgetown, they're all one. They was all black. 
That's what united them. But how they got there and 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 set themselves for the goals or the dreams or things that they wanted to excel at, they got there differently. Everybody's journey is different uh, to get there. And so, you know, your question was, you know, what can we do or how do we keep young boys or young men to knowing that you can be an athlete and also excel in other areas? You know, like I said, as coaches and the people around you, there has to be and there has to be some sort of standard and expectation. Whether you are, no matter where you come from, where your background is, if they, if the people around you are not putting standards and expectations on you, like I listened to this story of the, uh, of the, the professor here who brought the young man into her office hours and said, hey, here's, let me talk to you about your sport, what you do, but let's talk about going to be getting a PhD. There has to be some sort of standard expectation because if you put that out there, they will they will reach, we will reach for it. And I think that at a base level, no matter where you come from or what your background is or what your experience is or what your journey is, if there's a standard expectation, you will get there. My, my brother, young black man, died when he was 21, shot, gun violence, right? He had no standards and expectations. We had the same mother. I took a different path than he did. I had different people pouring into my life than he did. And so the people that poured in his life didn't set any standards and expectations for him, but I had people who poured into my life and set standards and expectations for me or gave me the option to see something different. And so I think there has to be a certain level. There's no right or wrong answer. There's not one thing that's the trick. It's not just one answer. It's multiple things, but there, got to, there has to be some sort of standards um, and expectations that we set for, for young men to be able to excel. And Dr. Deb, mm -hmm. one more thing to that. As a coach, it is our responsibility as we talk to our, our student athletes, you know, men or women, ask the questions. Before they come to our program, you talk to them. You get to know them. You get to know their situation, their circumstances. And you build that plan, those standards, with them before they even get there. We go through the four to five years of what it's going to look like. How do we set up those, those meetings, those internships, those opportunities? You put the people in front of the student athletes to give them that vision, to give them that hope, to give them those experiences. That's what we sign on for. That is our responsibility. And so recognizing that they come from all different walks of life, we have to help guide them. And I think sometimes that message is lost on just who they are as athletes and what they can do for your program, what they can do for your university, what they can do for your community. But I know as a coach and, and obviously with these two phenomenal coaches up here that their mission is people, it's serving. And so I think that that conversation has to be had first and then throughout their journey. How often are you checking in? How often are you following up? How often are you celebrating the small victories along the way? Because understand, knowing where they're from, there's adversity. There's going to be some. There's going to be moments where they don't, they may not feel like it or moments where they're frustrated or down. That's where we have to continue encouraging them along the journey to say, hey, you are on your way. You are right here. This is what's going to happen. But let's talk about how far you've come. So I think there has to be so much communication around where they are, where they want to go and celebrate every step. But they have to see it to believe it. And they have to know that they deserve it and they are worthy of it. Unapologetically. Coach. Very good. I'd like to piggyback off of, off of um, what the other coaches have have echoed already, but at the end of the day, one of the most powerful things that I've created at the University of Texas while I was there and what I encourage others to do now is mentoring. We don't realize that who pours into you in throughout your journey determines the expectations that you set for yourself. So having strong mentorship, and that's why I said, whenever you meet someone, you get a moment, even if it's only a moment to pour something in, don't just compliment them on, because as, as black men, they don't get complimented on the intelligence of their play, but their athleticism. And we have to begin to change the narrative on how we interact before we can expect them to change 
the narrative on what they're presenting. So we've got to begin to, that's why they kept quarterbacks out. They said we weren't smart enough. The young black men were not smart enough. Brady was smart enough. They had to be smart because he had no athleticism. Okay. But at the, at, I don't mean none, but it was limited. But you can't tell me Patrick Mahomes isn't making blink of the eye decisions in critical moments under high pressure. You can't tell me that Jalen Hurt has not evolved because everywhere he's gone, he's gotten minimized and yet he's elevated superiorly because he studied the game and because he's an intellect and because he had people who were pouring into that component of his person. We can't complain about what we see when we're feeding only one side of the picture. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you. As I sit here, I'm hoping that young researchers, young academics are listening to this and replacing athlete with yourself. Because what they're talking about is the same uh, navigation that's required as a young professor, right? You need people to believe in you. You need to have a support group. You need to have people that look like you for the modeling. You have to have the discipline. You have to believe that as much as you would just like to stay in the office and crunch numbers or do qualitative mixed methodology, that you have to get out and let people know your story. Let people know what your objectives are. Let people know that you want to volunteer for this, even though your heart is racing, you're not even sure that you can do it, right? We call it imposter syndrome. So it's the same thing with athletes. It's the same thing with academics. So hear these stories, but think about it from the context of what you're doing today in your department, in your unit, in your research institute. I want to remind us that it is Black History Month, and we're lifting up the resilience of Black women, how we show up, how we support others and serve others. Now, you all have lived a life of service, in particular, helping young minds. How do you manage your own stress level? Let's, let's, let's get to health. Uh, and what ways do you teach and practice healthy living? And we're going to be very transparent. Coach Burrell. Coach, we stressed out. <laughs> um, I actually went to my administrator and was like, we, as, as a college coach, we are asked to do so much. During COVID, I was the COVID czar. Uh, when, when sexual, when sexual assault stuff comes, comes up, I'm the sexual assault reporter, you know, counselor, I'm the academic person, I'm the, you know, if you're injured, I'm the, the person you're talking to you, what, 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 what you're going to, you know, how to get better. You know, we have so many roles and we are asked in our, in institutions, at least to be so many things and wear so many different hats that I'm telling you right now, you, we bring head coaches meeting, you're going to bring someone from student site to come and talk to you on how to talk to your athletes and how to do this and how to do that. They expect us to do a lot, but no one's doing anything for us. The thing that, that, that's happening, if you are a person that's, in, that's serving, is that we are being asked to do a lot for our students and for athletes. And do, but there's very, very little being done for those in, in, in institutions, at least, that are pouring out to these young people. They're just expecting us to keep giving, 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 giving. And so to answer your question, I'm doing a terrible job of it. The, the one thing I'm trying to do better is sleep because I didn't sleep. I wasn't sleeping. If I can sleep, <laughs> sleeping is key. Like I did not sleep because you not only do you have athletes that you're worried about, you have life. And the one thing that I've come to in this season of my life right now as a coach I am go Sheedy Gold. That's my name, Sheedy Gold. Is that my intent at this point uh, for mental health and just for just a quality of life is to know that I work at a university. Uh, track is not, you know, there's track life, but track is not life. <laughs> but there's such thing as track life, you know, but track is not life. And I work at my university. But my priority is to work for me and take care of me first instead of my university. I think for a while it was flipped 
y'all worked very hard for my university. I did everything, hours, so on and so forth. And now I will go to sleep and wake up early in the morning to work on me. We have a lot, right? We just established that. Uh, and, and I will say it's a work in progress, to be honest. Um, but what I'm proud of is that I have a support group of family, friends, that literally, my sister, got, <laughs> she's the middle child, you guys, she checks in every day, every day. We have our morning calls, my brother, sister, and I, and it's, Tasha, did you do your 10 minutes? Tasha, did you give yourself 20 minutes? Because you need those reminders because there is always something to do. And I think, you know, when, when, when I was a younger coach, to your point, you're working, you're, you're trying to prove, you're trying to get it done. Um, I'm a mom first too. And there were, there are so many things, you know, I had to let go of the mom guilt because as a younger coach, I spent so much time away from my son, who's 25 years old, that I took control for my 17 year old daughter who plays volleyball. Now my practice times are around her volleyball because when you know better, you do better. And I don't make excuses for that. I think I've had to learn how to say no sometimes or do a better job delegating out within your staff. Um, so that frees up 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And you would be amazed at just what 20 minutes of quiet time will do for your mental health, your physical health. I was not sleeping. I was not, I was up and, and they knew it because the staff would hate to respond to my text message at one o'clock in the morning because then they're like, dang, she's up. So now I'm going to keep texting. Um, but there is always something to do. So I think as I've gotten older, uh, sometimes your body tells you when you really need to pay attention to it. I'll tell you that. Um, I will tell you just in, without going too deep in COVID, when everything shut down, there were things that I found out about myself, my health, because I was still, that if there wasn't COVID pause, I probably wouldn't have heard it. I probably wouldn't have listened. And so we can't be all for others if we don't take care of ourselves. And as, as coaches, as former athletes, you have this drive, you have this competitive drive. But right now, I'm taking care of me. That's important. Well, for me, um, I'm 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 going to go ahead and do a true confession. Uh, I'm not really that dedicated. <laughs> I wasn't that dedicated in college, in grad school. I know I had to have almost a 4.0 to graduate. You had to have over three three point in grad school. I came up with systems because when I graduated from Auburn, there had not been another black. I was the first black female athlete to graduate and get a degree to actually make it all the way through. But I learned to have to discipline myself because when we traveled, there was no tutors. My, my teachers pretty much told me to drop courses. No black had ever graduated in the school of social work. I did. Why? Because I was disciplined. As soon as I got home, I did my work while I was still fresh and I could play and watch TV and hang out all the rest of the evening. I had a system and that system stayed with me. When I work, I work. And when I don't, I don't. After the accident, it really taught me because I had limited capabilities. And so I had a, this much energy when I, when I wake up in the morning. And so I'd have to decide and prioritize. All of this experience has helped me because the other thing is, is the spirituality of it. I'm, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. I grew from religion into spirit because religion didn't resolve my issues. It, it introduced me to the God I serve, but the God they were serving me wasn't serving right. <laughs> and so I kept studying. And as I studied, I learned different mechanisms. And I, as I learn, I can teach. And so one of the things that I began to do is to try to help alleviate stresses when no one was alleviating them for me. 
is to be very observant. And in order to be efficient, you got to be observant. You got to know your systems. If not, you'll always be working in opposition of your system. You got to know when to fight and when not to fight. And that's the thing that we don't do as coaches. We feel like, and athletes, we feel like we're supposed to master everything. No, sometimes I'm going to let you win so I can keep my peace of mind. If that's the way you want to think, I'm okay. We can agree to disagree whether you agree with that or not. And I think sometimes not having that need to always win in everything that you do, not to have to be right in everything you do. And the, and the uh, bottom line is at some point you have to get quiet. We don't do quiet well, which is why there were so many mental challenges during COVID. I try to teach coaches to go in quiet, to step away from the issues so that you can see them clearly. And I always have a policy. If I go two nights, if I go one night and I can't get it right, I have resources. My resources may not be your resources, but they need to be. And my resources are this, their philosophy, which is I don't need no co-conspirators in how bad it is. I need co-conspirators on what the solution is. So all of my support systems are solution honest based. I need to know, is it me or is it them? Well, this time it's you. Okay, I need to, sh I can shift that. If it's them, okay, let's talk about how do I navigate around this in order to get where I want to go. So it's it's really honing in on solutions and seeking help. It's the people you have around you calling my sister saying, have you took in, taken 10 minutes? And sometimes it's just walking out of the room and breathing. I don't stay, I used to be called standoffish. Why? I realized I was sitting in the stands talking to other coaches and I felt worse than when I sat down because they was just, compl they complained about the athletes. They complained about the weather. They complained about the lane. They complained about the refs. They complained, I don't need this. I'm trying to win. If it, the conversation don't make you feel good, walk away from the conversation. So I started to alleviate a lot of the negativity. And sometimes that means a little isolation and I'm okay with that. We can see that for sure. <laughs> In doctoral studies, I remember writing a paper thinking about the holistic athlete and person. And so I came up with a model called NESS. And it's four things that I try to be mindful of. Nutrition. And so I try to make sure I eat something green every day. We know the power of green when we think about nutrition. Exercise. So we have to move. So we have to get out of our offices. We have to be strategic, even if it means just walking. And the research is out there that walking, great benefits, just as much as a jog or a run. The second is, the third is sleep. And this is where I'm challenged because as you all know, there's so much to do and there's a certain amount of time. But we think about time management, which I don't think is healthy. We need to think about managing ourselves because you can never manage time right? And so what are we doing to make sure that we put our head on the pillow? And don't believe that research that says that you can manage on six hours of sleep. It is not true, right? So you need to go to bed. What is it going to take? And there's so many things that we can refer to in terms of how to be better at making sure that we get enough hours of sleep. And then the last one is spirituality. I do believe that it is healthy. It is better to be connected to a creator because that guides us. So find that peace, find that faith that works for you. The people around you. Isn't there a saying that you can tell a lot about a person by the three to five closest people to you? So if everybody thinks about the three to five people that are closest to you, not necessarily your parents or your guardians, but do they describe you? Do they reflect you? Do they reflect you? So let's think about these young men again in brain health. So as mothers, as aunties, as partners, as close friends, what can you say to Black men in terms of as they age, how do they be better, feel better, and have joy? Coach? 
I think that conversation needs to start now. Uh, we can't wait until they're done with sport. We can't wait until, um, you know, they're out of school, they're 40, they're 50 years old, no different than all the other conversations that we have with our young men and our young women uh, in their developmental years and, their, and, and while they're growing here in college and while they're, you know, young professionals, you need to have those conversations. Um, we talk about mental health, we talk about physical health, we talk about nutrition, but are we proactive and talk about talking about the next phase? And I think the way that you present it, because again, there, you know, I, my dad, my brother, a lot of them, you know, I, I've seen mommy push them, you know, push daddy to the doctor, basically while he's crawling to the doctor because he was just so stubborn to go. But I think if you present it early. And, and you let them know that, hey, this is longevity. This is going to allow you to still do and enjoy the things that you're doing now in your 30s, in your 40s. Then it becomes habit. Uh, and I also think that uh, the more awareness and communication you have around every topic, going to the doctor is not a bad thing. It's preventative, right? Learning more about yourself is not a bad thing. It, it's the right thing to do. And so I just think the conversations need to start earlier. I think we need to have these conversations um, in college. We have them around every topic, right? Drugs, alcohol, you know, anything you think of, but we're not talking about the next phase of their life. We are talking about it with finances. We are talking about it in other aspects, but we're not talking about it with their health. And so I just think that that needs to happen earlier. It needs to happen sooner. And as we bring in uh, women's health speakers to come in and talk to our student athletes, then hopefully they're bringing in men's health to come in and talk to the male student athletes. If they're not, that's a way. So I just think we have to start the communication earlier and talk about the positive outcomes before they become negative. Coach Burrow? Um, I don't know if I have an, an answer for that per se. You know, my grandfather had dementia. And so we have, uh, uh, my grandfather had dementia. My mother's struggling early now. Um, and no matter what we could have told that man, he was going to do what he's going to do. His friend, best friend was Jack. His name was Jack, Jack last name Daniels, Jack Daniels. Uh, <laughs> and so that didn't help. I think what she's saying, it's, it's, it has a lot to do with education and awareness. You know, in our community, we have uh, typically have a lot high blood pressure. No matter how much, how much we hear that African-Americans are predisposed to having high blood pressure, we still eat the way we eat sometimes, right? And so it's just a matter, I think, of uh, awareness and education. Hopefully, the more awareness, education and examples we see that we can, we can make an impact and make, bring more awareness. I don't, I've never heard, actually, of, of a men's health can I be honest with you? I've never, I've, I've, I've never been to and never heard of a men's health conference, or even at the university level of some of them bringing in. We we have a women's clinic right. in our in our in our uh, training room. We don't have anything for men in our training room. A women's clinic, like we have gyne gynecologists, mental health, nutrition, all for women. We have nothing for women for men at our university. So. You know, Sounds this, like a good idea, right? This for me is a, uh, you know, is is something that I had not even thought about because it just wasn't part of, of my, own, my own awareness. That's the awareness there, coach. See how I can get away with saying coach to anyone? <laughs> um, for me, I think the primary issue surrounding men is the word men. No, that's a human being. And all human beings are built differently. And because we put that term, especially black men, or even to some degree black women, or even some degrees more black women, there are more stereotypes about how strong you should be, how you should present. And if you object, you're being um, the B word. Or if you're a guy and you're going through a hard time, you're acting like a B and we need to start to understand that we have to learn people. Who is he? 
where is he from? And what is the point of origin of the behavior? We see the behavior, we address the behavior, but we don't look at the point of origin because that means to look internally. And we don't look internally at men the same way we do women. You need to start having those conversations. I can't tell you how many males, whether professional or collegiate athletes, or even just corporate or young men, I just left a scenario where I was with a 16 year old guy and I had to let him cry on my shoulder. And you know what he asked me? Can you come back? My friends need this too. And I took him to the, we went walking by the water. We had long talks and he poured out and he asked questions that it wasn't safe enough because he was too made to feel too insecure because he didn't know. Could you imagine walking your whole life and you're supposed to know and take anything off of anybody and still present strong? And we wonder why there's such a breakdown right now. And to that point, you know, my son is 25 and he played basketball, division two basketball. He's this six, eight, just beautiful, beautiful specimen. You know where he gets it from his mom. Um, but the conversations around my son who got more academic money than he did athletic money, who graduated summa cum laude, but to so many people, I, I got the phone calls in the, in the afternoon or the middle of the night. Mom, why am I questioned when I know the answer? Why am I questioned when I speak up? Now, as a mother, I've raised him to stand tall with his head high, his shoulders back. But as a mother... At times I tell him to shrink so he comes home safely. Understand the mixed messages for this 25 year old black man. I was raised to be strong, but society isn't prepared for me to be strong. So as a mother, I have to continue to encourage him on the days he cries, on the days he's weak, on the days he, and he can only cry and feels comfortable to cry to his mother. And so these are the conversations that we need to continue to have with our young black men. So when they are 30, 40, 50, they are okay to cry, they understand what's happening and they're prepared. It breaks my heart to still have to worry every time I lay my head down. He doesn't get to enjoy himself as some other 25-year-olds that don't look like him. He can't just go to a normal outing party and me not worry. To this day, honey, go, but don't stay long. Be aware of your surroundings. Don't be out too late because God forbid you, you get pulled over and you have to, again, shrink. These are the things that not everybody has to do, deal with. But I know for me as a mom that these are the conversations that we've had since he, since he could even go on his own away from me. But these are the conversations throughout his career, summa cum laude, president's list, president's council. But when he goes out there, it doesn't matter. The other tools are how to survive. And that is every day, 24 hours a day, as a mom with a black son. Hashtag real talk, Coach Beth. And I would say this, whatever you don't allow them to share and create safe spaces for young men and men in general to share, they internalize. And the more garbage they internalize, the more the behavior will begin to reflect that either they will become self-destructive or they will be a destructive being. But a hurt being needs healing. They don't need just punishment, but we could minimize the hurt 
by addressing the internal hurt that occurs. And that's what we don't do with young. We don't have those conversations. We don't have them. Thank you. So we want to hear from the audience. And so we'll have the mic ready. So uh, as the mics come around, uh, one thing that I did learn about being in this space is about the importance of social isolation. And what I found from observation, I'm sure the research is out there that women, we do a better job of bonding and connecting with one another as we age. We really do. And far too often, men, they go into their own little cave, right? They might go to the barber shop and cut it up a bit, but they have to continue to engage, find hobbies with other people, engage. That's an important part of, of healthy, uh, of brain health. Yes, right here. Yeah, I wanted to say earlier today, I was attending an event where there was a bunch of young ladies. And in, during that event, there was a question that was asked. The question was, they asked the young ladies to name five of the richest women in the United States, particularly women of color. They couldn't answer it. They said to actually identify the last five Miss Americas, women of color, they could not answer it. They asked him to identify five women in sports who won gold medals. I think Simone Biles may have come up, but that was it. They asked them, now I want you to think about five people that have had a direct impact on your life. And if they are in this room, I want you to get up and go, and there's over a hundred young ladies. They got up and they ran to those women. And the rationale behind that message, I think Coach Burrell, you opened it up when you said, it's not about the medals, it's not about the accolades. It's about the impact that I have on those people that I encounter. You two closed it. You coach basically talked about it from a coach perspective. You talked about it from a parent's perspective. We as mentors, and that's who we are in this room, we appreciate and, and commend you. And I'm not being biased, but I'm gonna say this, as women coaches, you brought forth nurture and compassion as well as passion. And I think we as mentors need to recognize that we are more than, I'm a doctor, healthcare professionals. We are more than educators. We are people who truly have an impact. And I'm gonna say this because I come from Detroit, Michigan, straight from the east side, where a woman who sat on a porch when I walked down the street told me, you will have five children and you'll be on welfare. Now, unfortunately I have no children, but I had to take care of that woman. I was her provider. When I walked into that room, she was in awe. We are somebody. And I wanna end by saying this, Oftentimes we, and I'm saying people of non-color, look, I work in environments in which sometimes I walk around and I'm the only person of color. I work in Tucson at Banner Hospital and oftentimes I'm looking around and even as their top researcher, I have not been approached to ask to come up and talk about clinical trials. And I don't say anything until unfortunately there were mishap or misconduct of research and they have to seek me. So I think it's so important that the message that you guys deliver today, that's the message. It's not the word coach, it's the nurturer, it's the advisor, it's the counselor. That's what we see on the stage. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Roy McReynolds III. I'm a, a fifth year PhD student and first year Black Men's Brain Health Scholar. Um, and I wanted to ask you guys a question that deals with the mentorship aspect. All of you all are mentors, as you said. Um, so how does one maintain or build the self-confidence and self-actualization that you all possess in ourselves and in our mentees that we may have? To be honest with you, the problem that we have within this present society is that we're looking for a strategy, a strategy that works. There is no such thing as a strategy that works because everybody's lack of confidence is rooted differently. So getting to know the person, I can begin to help you by not objecting to anything that you're saying, but by presenting an alternative. Yeah, I understand that. Because this is the way I think about that. What we tend to do is, no, you're wrong. And the minute I tell him he's wrong, I've contributed to his lack of 
self-confidence. The a, a blind man can see a mistake. Don't mean he can he know how to go to it and fix it. So it's easy to point out the mistake. It takes work to help people build. And when you say build, what does that imply to you? Just the word build confidence. Just build confidence. You got to have work, got to put in some work, and it's you got to be in it for the long haul. It's not one conversation. There isn't one strategy. And there, and if you can stay positive, you've contributed to that person's journey. Whether you agree with where they are, I under, I'm agreeing that I understand how you feel. And then here's some something else that you might want to add on to that. I've not taken anything from him, but hopefully I've given. And if we can just go with that, don't be negative. Don't point out the obvious. What do coaches have a tendency to say? Didn't I tell you to lay the ball up? Why did you switch hands? So what is that person thinking about? Switch hands. So, so they're going to turn around and odds are because you've reinforced the negative, they're going to turn around and repeat the negative subconsciously under pressure. So I'm not even going to address the negative, but I'm going to address it with a positive. Next time, switch hands and, and pop it here, right? And you, would, you wouldn't have gotten blocked. So that's the way I would do it, is that one, there is no strategy, so stop looking for one because there's no, no, nothing that fits everybody. Get to know the person. Stop pointing out the obvious, <laughs> the negativity. Thanks. Coach, you there? Well, I think... It one thing that, that I, I use with our team is player-led, coach-supported. And you don't hear that all the time. Uh, my job and my staff's job is to empower our young women and to empower them to use their voice. Now, we have to help them with those tools. We have to know their why. We have to know, you know, what is the end goal? What do they want to accomplish and help them navigate that plan? But the more that we can empower them to speak, the more that we can empower them to face their fears uh, and then use their platform and know that they have one, the stronger that they are going to be. And I talk about, this is my fourth university, my fourth rebuild. And each one had their own challenges, but all of them had young women who needed that reassurance, who needed that motivation, who needed a champion for them. You have to be a really good listener before you can be a great leader, a great mentor, a great motivator. Sometimes we just, to your point, we always have an answer. Sometimes they just want you to hear them. Young people want to be heard. They want to be seen. They want to know that they matter. They want to know that their ideas and their opinions and their dreams are important. And so the more that we can be that advocate, the more that we can be the resource, but also help them. That's where the mentorship, sometimes people get so caught up in what they did and who they are versus the young person in front of you. Who are you? Sometimes they don't even know. So then it's, what do you like? Sometimes they don't know. So then I think that's our responsibility to just help them find out who they are, what are, the, what, are, what are the things that they like, and then help guide them. But in our program, it's player-led, coach-supported, because my goal is to make sure they win at life. Wonderful. We'll be talking more about this in Emerging Scholars uh, workshops, but I like to teach coaching, mentoring, and sponsorship. And we need all three, in particular sponsorship when we're talking about moving from one level in an organization to another level and talking about hiring and positions. But coaches talk to you. Coaches talk to you, as Coach uh, Bev described, giving you some type of instruction, feedback on a skill. Mentors talk with you. 
And you can have a mentor for a week. You can have a mentor for five years. They care about you. They guide you. They give you advice. But what we oftentimes miss is sponsorship. Sponsors talk about you. And that is when you have someone at a level that is higher than yours, and they recognize your brilliance, they recognize your intelligence, they recognize your performance ability, and they seek you out. And that is another reason why people of color, people who've been oppressed, people who've been neglected, need to get out and tell your story and showcase your goods. Because sponsors are looking for people that they want to elevate to their level because you deserve it. Now, you can't go up to a sponsor, say, a person that you really admire or appreciate and say, hey, would you be my sponsor? No, they're watching. And they're the ones who invite you to places that normally you would not know about, right? They're going to put you in places where you're not even supposed to be at because of their positional power. They want you there. They think that you belong. So coaches talk to you. Mentors talk with you. Sponsors talk about you. So we'll talk more about uh, that with the emerging scholars. Other questions? Other questions for this amazing panel? Yes. Oh, can you wait for a microphone, please? Thank you. It's like 40 yard dash right there. Oh, very good. Um, so as a educator of educators, that was my career, academic career, teaching teachers and special ed is my area been a special ed teacher, boots on the ground, uh, as well as the professor. So I would be in the schools teaching my young students how to tune into the child in Southern Georgia. I did a lot in the, in the rural schools. So I go in and I would teach them how to um, wait. So listening is also waiting because I think sometimes when a young person or a student athlete or in my own experience with black athletes, they come from some different geographic areas in their identity of being black. They don't have words yet. So wait, because they may not know how to speak. You just wait. And sometimes I think holding silence, waiting, and then the breathing, I, I would do that relaxing breathing and they would mirror it. And I learned this a long time ago with my special ed, my students in special ed, the little ones. If I just calm and breathe, then they calm and then they start to discover some words or try to trip over some words. So I think waiting and pausing has a lot of value as well because they don't have words yet. Thank as you for that. We know the importance of breathing, right, coaches? And in fact, if anybody plays golf, you know one of the most important things you, you have to do is breathe. Breathe. Other questions, comments? Let's go back to the panel then, okay? So tell us more about your experiences with aging, dementia, more specifically. What are the things that hold you tight and the things that you clap about and find joy when we think about brain health and what we're seeing out here in the world? Coach Burrell? You know, I... For me, and in, in, it's a it's a close family um, uh, issue. My my grandfather passed away um, in a in a in a nursing home. My grandmother now is at eighty nine and is is I'm you know caretaking for her, assisting caretaking for her, and it's amazing that you know just brain health in general. I have a really good friend who studies, you know, who's all about uh, neuroscience with athletes and how the brain works with athletes um, in different ways. You can stimulate different nerves and things like that. But it's it's amazing to me how even with, you know, my grandfather's decline. Um, and I don't know what it's what it's his decline came from life, you know, even with his decline that he was a funny dude. Let me tell you, when you have people to be hilarious, right? Some of the things he'd say would be hilarious, but he never um, forgot. He forget you, but he didn't forget you. Like he'd forget things, but he knew who his family was. And so in my mind, we're talking about brain health, you know, with men in, in our community, because most times, you know, 
going through the situation I'm with my grandmother now, I've read that most times people of color, no matter what color, tend to keep their family members at home until they um, pass away. I have dementia, where others tend to put their, their family members in facilities. And most times people decline a lot faster in their facilities than they, when they, than they are at home. And so how to continue to nurture through someone who's struggling with brain health issues, I think is key because even with my grandfather, when we got to the point we had to put him in a home, we were there. I was in college, but we were there. They were here. They were there every single day and we showed up. So being able to um, not just recognize the signs and symptoms and what you do, but as a, as a community, a family member, a friend, brother, sister, or whatever, being able to continue to nurture that person through struggles with brain health, I think is key. Thank you. And the importance of touch and yes. hugging. Yeah. Yeah. Touching one another. So I want to close this out with this last question. You've got the magic wand now and thinking about the landscape of youth sports or college sports or even a young professional athletes. If you had that magic wand, what would you recommend? What would you advise that administrators could do, should do for better outcomes uh, mentally or physically? Coach Adair? Well, I think uh, having been at four different institutions um, played, obviously, uh, I've seen it grow. And what I mean, it is resources. I think that, you know, for us with our student athletes, we can offer so so many more resources and opportunities for their mental health, for their wellness. Um, we have sports psych. Four years ago, we did not, you know, at, at you know, at other institutions. There, we have a nutritionist. We have moments where we have reflective times where they're allowed to be vulnerable and allowed to have safe spaces and just having conversations about when they may be weak. And I think that we don't have enough of those conversations with our young people and giving them permission to not be strong all the time, to not be perfect all the time. So I think, you know, for administrators, um, for our university, for our, for our department, I can speak to having all of the tools, the necessary tools that equip our student athletes holistically for success. Uh, and I think that you have to ask the student athletes, what do you need? Sometimes I think we forget to ask them. And if you have these resources, are they working? Ask the student athletes what matters to them. You know, I think that that is so important for administrators to know. Sometimes, you know, we're looking at, hey, what's popular or what universities have these different resources or, or programs. What do our student athletes need? Don't just check off a box, have the conversations. Meet them where they are. Evaluate what, what's being done. How do we enhance it? How do we improve it? Do we have everything? Do they have what they need? Um, this is a different time for our student athletes. It's a, it's a very, they have so many outside influences, distractions, and pressures. They go to Instagram for their reality in a place where their coach may not understand. I think it's important to have a staff put together of a diverse group of people, not only you know in, in gender, um, but in age that can speak their language. There's so many things that you have to do for our young people. And, and I just think that, um, for our administrators, for our university, for our community. Uh, we can check off a lot of boxes here at Arizona State. Uh, and that is that is a beauty because I know so many other programs cannot at, at other universities. But I think the more that we ask our student athletes the questions, our students the questions, what do they need? And then again, meet them where they are. Coach Burrell? Um, I, I'm at a mid-major program, and so we are limited in resources. And so from a, an administrative um, perspective of what 
in our in our program what we're able to do because not all talents created equal life ain't fair and not every place is the same and so people have to navigate uh what's going on with our young people in terms of mental health in different ways based on where they're at and so the administration may do one thing and i may do something else because i'm with this athlete here and i may be able to provide this whereas my administrator can provide a program um and because of that, I think that some administrations tend to look at things as always as a program. You know, if, if, if you need to fix something, you're going to check a box, create a program. And they think that they're going to create this program and the athletes are just going to show up. <laughs> okay, we're going to do this, 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 this. We're going to give you this, 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 this service. All these, we're having this right now. We have all these mental health services available for you. And ain't nobody showing up. Because the kids are like, it doesn't help. They only tell us to come four times. The program is come and see the therapist one, two, three, four. And then after that, you're a fix. You're on your own, <laughs> you know? And so the, the programming is, is an issue because they are just checking a box because we're, they're just trying to cover, which is what is becoming a serious concern and not necessarily a crisis, but concern among young people in general. Crisis, post-COVID especially. It's a crisis. And so the idea of programming from an administrator doesn't really work because the athletes can tell you that it's not authentic and it's not genuine. And so the reason that I, I shy away from, even in, even in my own department, I let my athletes navigate those on their own, on their own, because even in recommending them, I don't, I can't recommend it when I know that they'll still come back having not had a, a change or help, not even getting helped. Here's the thing. We're trying to help, but we're not helping. But we're not helping. And the reason we're not helping is because what you said, we're not asking the right questions. We're just trying to check a box and we're programming these kids. We're thinking that, and if I can be honest and transparent, is that they just want to cover CYA. You know, we've got to say that we're doing X, Y, and Z so we can say we did it, we did it, and we made it available to you. So now it's your choice, athlete. It's up to you. And now you're responsible for getting help because we provided the service for you. So the athletes you send to go get the help in the service, mental health, talking about mental health especially, they go and it doesn't help. It doesn't work. But the university can say, well, we did our part. So it's a it's a bigger and deeper issue. Um then just, you know, we have services available for student athletes. I think more so it is a, you know, they keep trying to educate us as coaches, which gives us another job, <laughs> but it's our job. We do it. We do it naturally. If you're a coach, you're actually doing some of these things naturally. And there's, and I'll speak to one more thing about this. There's also a, a, a generational gap because when I was coming up, you just got to go through it. You know, you, you, you're struggling. You don't have your confidence is low. You 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 know you, you got problems at home. You're depressed. I don't care. Show up today's the, this is the workout today. This is what we got to do. Let's get it done. Now we got to ask these kids, how are you today? How you feeling? You all right? This is what we got today. How you feel about that? Because if you don't do that, that kid will then go and say that they feel, you know, some kind of way because coach made them do something that they didn't didn't want to do or they need a mental health day. I don't know if you get mental health days. I get mental health days for my athletes now. Coach can have a mental health day. And when they ask for a mental health day, you know, old school, be like, what do you need a mental health day for? <laughs> right? But nowadays, you got to give that kid that mental health day. Because if you don't do it, you may not get out of them what you need out of them when you need them. And so things are changing. I think we are in this, you know, this, uh, this gray area. We're trying to navigate it and figure it out. And from an administrative point of view, all I can say is that programming doesn't work. And so what we what I would hope that we would do is be a little more genuine in really understanding what the needs are and addressing the need. You can't meet everybody's need. It's impossible. But there's things that are common amongst everybody. And I think the one thing about being listened to is the biggest one of all. Thank you. Coach County. I'll just quickly try to sum up kind of what everybody else is feeling. But from my perspective, which is we as adults created the environment and now we don't want to deal with it head on. 
So let's just understand that these kids didn't infuse these behaviors and this mindset and this in this ideology on their own, it was infused by the generations that went before them. So that's where the issues have to be addressed. And you can't have one sports psychologist deal with tons of issues. Nine times out of 10, they don't care, they're overwhelmed and they're checking the box. And they're, they're just overwhelmed. So my ideology is, is that we have to go back to the basics as parents and keep pouring in and I say as a parent, I meant as a community of parents, because there is no one parent. Everything is being influential within that person's existence. So what I'm saying to you is, if this is going to be addressed, it has to be addressed from a community's perspective, because it was created from a societal perspective. And what really facilitated this pivot, so to speak, in athletics money. Everybody's seeking the big dollar. Everybody's seeking the trophy. They night. We are not the norm in coaching. Most coaches are only in it for the winning and you making me look bad. So I'm going to blame you. Never penalize the person that's producing your livelihood. And that's what they're doing. They're blaming the kids for their issue. Why didn't you get, go to youth, go, go watch some of the youth sports, watch who they praise and watch who they critique. And you'll see where the problem originated. So how can it be fixed? It has to be a, be fixed by the adults. Can I, can I make one more comment about that? Because because of that, there is there is a there is a line, like not a line, it's it's complex because student athletes nowadays know exactly what they're doing. So while we are trying to, you know, facilitate and help and 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 mentor and grow these young men and women, there's also an, an area where coaches have to be careful because the the relationship has to be a two-way street where there's a trusting relationship that goes both ways and that doesn't always happen because it's 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 very gray like you said there's some athletes or some situations where as a coach you do have to protect yourself like you do have to take a step back and be like this one's not for me to deal with you know that issue right there i i got to remove myself from that or i can't that's not for me. So as I think Beth says, so we are not for everybody, but the ones that you're for, you got to be there for. And, but somebody's there for that one, for that one care, that one issue, the community. Yeah. And so, you know, there is, there is a trust that goes both ways between coaches and athletes because athletes have a lot of power these days. We had no power. When I was, when I was a young athlete, I didn't even, the AD, hi, I walked by. Now the kids walk into AD's office and be like, Coach Burrell said, <laughs> and she didn't let me, and I wanted a day off, and she said I couldn't have a day off. That's what athletes do now. Well, think about the discipline what parents had trouble with now. They're getting in trouble because you you discipline your kid, kid in public, and they mad, but then they also mad because you don't discipline them as they get older they become a problem in public. So it started there and it filtered to sports. There should have been some boundaries set. I agree with it. They were mistreating athletes, but now you swung the pendulum all the way over to the other extreme and you're giving people the power to self-destruct as opposed to teaching. There has to be a resting place in the middle. And every now and then it should swing, but it should rest in the middle. Well, and I think to the point of player-led, coach-supported, I come in right there and that lets them know that they matter. Now, we have standards of the program and those are non-negotiable, but it's our job of coaches to empower you. So we're going to give you those tools to use your voice. We're going to give you those tools to empower yourself. Again, there's standards to our program, non-negotiable. But I think you have to have those conversations first before they come to your program. These are the expectations here, and they may not be for you, but they're here. The other thing with mental health and, and, and sports psych and, and 
you know, I just think that that is on the forefront everywhere, uh, especially in our programs. There needs to be more peer to peer conversations, peer to peer. Are we educating our peers to be able to talk to their peers? Training our players in the locker room, right? We, we, take, we take them through leadership courses. Are we training our student athletes to know what triggers are? To recognize crisis, how to diffuse situations, crisis management, because that's what's happening. It's crisis. It's not just a locker room squabble. It's not just win and lose. It becomes crisis. And so now we have to teach peer-to-peer crisis management and help them help each other. I think that's the next conversation. Pearls of wisdom. Let's give them a hand. Wow. So there's just so much more that we could talk about, you know, with your closing on the peer to peer. Again, it's academics as well in research. Do we know how to speak to one another to help each other be better? As academics, as researchers, can we receive feedback well? How are we taking that in? How are we disciplining ourselves? And then the other point around relationships, which we started out with, and Malik knows this, I tell all my students, it's not what you know, it's not who you know, it's who knows you on a favorable basis. Because you can walk around collecting all the business cards and getting numbers, but it's important to have people know what you're about, what your interests are, what your objectives are, because you can't be everywhere. And you want people to be able to speak about you and your goodness. So it's not what you know, it's not who you know, it's who knows you on a favorable basis. So I'll close with saying that I'm very blessed to know you all on a favorable basis. I wanna thank this panel. Thank you for your engagement. We're gonna take a stand up break and then we're gonna continue with the men's sports series spotlight. We've got Guy Troop here moderating. So everybody do a stand and stretch and we're gonna transition. Thank you.
One, two, one, two.
We're good, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We have one more amazing panel to get us through day two. And I want to remind you again, if you have questions for the panel, you can use the WUVA app. We will also have the running mic. And we really need your feedback on the day two survey. Feedback is essential to keep events like this going. We need your feedback. We're not telling you what to say, but we just want to hear your voice. I'm really excited about this sports spotlight series featuring the men, men who have accomplished great things. My dear friend, Guy Troop is the moderator. You can look at his bio, in fact, all the gentlemen's bios, but Guy has been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I mean, he's done everything. He has nurtured young men and women. Uh, he has um, been an administrator at all levels, professional sports, college. Uh, he is the host of the 23rd, 23rd Players Networking event, as in where most of us are headed after today. We'll be journeying over about five minutes away to this amazing networking uh, event with uh, former NFL players, friends, the support group, us. Uh, it's going to be an amazing gathering. Again, if you don't have your ticket, you can do that through the uh, app. And then we have four gentlemen who have played at the highest level. And I'm really excited about Jordan Clark here, who's still an uh, Arizona State current student. Uh, but we've got Will Shields, Al Smith, and Jonathan Ledbetter. Guy Troop. Hey. Appreciate it. I, I want to start with thanking Dr. Turner and uh, Dr. Stroman for having a vision. And this is a vision that it takes a village to execute. So at all levels, 
Uh, if any of these men have children, they're in the village and the mission. If any of these gentlemen have grandparents still living, they're in the mission. And inside of all of that, we're all in the village. So we appreciate you guys for what you're doing by researching and studying this issue. We appreciate this distinguished panel for participating. So I want to get right in. And, and, and one thing I'd like to do is, it, I'm a serious guy, but I like to have some fun. So let's be light here. Let's have some fun. Uh, so I want to just start with uh, one statement about the, these men. It's a cradle to grave approach. This young college guy could be doing a lot of things Super Bowl weekend, but he's with you old academics, right? And he's willing to learn. The active NFL player is probably just waking up from the party last night. But Jonathan is here. Al Smith is a uh, he's on the board of the NFL alumni on the board of the Player Care Foundation. He had uh, hundreds of places he could be, but he chose to be here with us. And then Will Shields could get a hundred thousand dollar check as a Hall of Famer for a speaking appearance. But he chose to share with us. And I, I might inflate the number a little bit, Will, right? That number, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. If you're willing to pay that, we can still negotiate it. Yeah, if that's yeah. what you want to do, you yeah. know, we can work on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so let's just jump out and just I'd like for you guys to all just think about how you chose to jump on this panel first, just open-ended. What is it that made you choose to do this? We'll start with you, Jordan. Uh, I would say for me, uh, I kind of jump at opportunities like this, uh, especially to learn from such distinguished and accomplished men that look like me, uh, like the rest of the men that are sitting up here. So, you know, to be able to sit up here on the stage uh, with these men, you know what I'm saying, in this room with you all, uh, people who have accomplished things that I look to accomplish myself, you know, people who have already been there. Uh, just the opportunity is something that, that I always jump at. You know, I'm just always willing to learn and, and excited for the opportunity. So I appreciate you guys. Um, just piggybacking off of that, um, I'm just grateful to be here as well. Um, I think it's important for a black man, especially men you know, that look like me and have done some of the things that I'm you know, trying to do and have done myself already, um, just to talk, um, talk about mental health, talk about awareness. Um, I don't think we do that enough, especially as men. And um, I think it's important to come and just express yourself and to know that as men, it's a safe place and to be able to talk to other men and uh, open up. Uh, so I'm here and I'm a firm believer in, um, you know, everyone has a testimony, your story is important and um people need to hear that and i have a crazy story i'm sure everyone else does and um i just want to be able to share my experiences just so that someone else doesn't have to go through some of the things that i did or that they can use my story to uplift themselves in another manner well first and foremost it's definitely a pleasure and an honor to be here uh in a situation like this um with a topic like this a lot of times you know with topics like this um people shy away uh it's not uh, popular to talk about things like that when it comes to health or mental health, uh, because it's kind of like an unseen thing, so to so to speak. And being able to bring awareness to that and be able to not only bring awareness, but uh, finding ways and looking at ways to, uh, to improve, uh, especially black men's health. Uh, you want to be able to embrace that, enhance that, uh, pass it on to uh, the next generation. So as as kids come up, as athletes come up, or different individuals, you don't have to be an athlete to have a, a brain health of situation, but to continue to build that. And just like any other muscle or whatever, you take care of that, uh, your brain, just like you would any other part of your body. And that intrigues me uh, to be able to find that the next level to be able to build on that on those type of things. And uh, I'm a, uh, it's definitely a pleasure to, to be a part of that and to be able to help enhance that awareness. Well, for me, it was building out health and history. It's one of those things I have a history I've been with you forever. We've been to 20 of these uh, different conferences in different cities and different places. Uh, I've been able to basically bring different business models for health and wellness. And so that's my passion. My passion is trying to build the healthiest you you can be. And why not do it in, in this space to be able to talk about all the different things that you go through, you feel, and what you really want to know is what are you doing to make yourself the best you you can be? And that's in every aspect of life. And to me, that's why I wanted to be here and be a part of it. So we can discuss, hey, and find out where we are and then try to build on that so we can keep expanding that knowledge. 
millions of people will watch the Super Bowl this this year uh, in a couple of days. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have come to this city, and what they're really trying to do is cele celebrate athlete athleticism and competition. So I want you guys to just think about when you first smell the grass, when you first picked up the ball, and just share sort of that ride to where you are and so a few highs about your football career uh with the with 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 everyone yeah, wh whoever wants to jump in first we don't have to go up and down yeah uh for me uh football has been a part of my life since i was born uh my father actually played uh, in the national football league so far as long as i can remember that's been my plan a that's been what i've wanted to do has been my dream uh, I started playing football in kindergarten, and I've been playing it since then. Uh, I would say a high for me uh, was signing, you know, my national letter of intent to come here. Uh, it was just uh, a culmination of a lot of work. And, you know, for the majority of my life and my football career, it's been about my father. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people like to make it about my father. So um, just signing that, you know what I'm saying? It was kind of like a, like a vindicating feeling for myself. Um, and just having that opportunity to continue the legacy that my dad said and uh, my grandfather before him, you know what I'm saying? It was just a, it was a really dope moment for me. So that's my football journey. I'll definitely say um, I've been playing football all my life as well. Um, I started at a young age. I actually quit football when I was younger. I had two older brothers um, that were on the same team as me, uh, a bigger kid. So I always played up. So I ended up quitting football and it wasn't until I moved to Georgia, actually. I started picking it back up in middle school um, and I fell in love with the game. Um, ended up being one of the highly recruited kids um, in the country, top five defensive tackle from Georgia, committed to Alabama. Um, it was a surreal moment for me. I went from a private school for one year that told me I wouldn't get any offers, transferred back to my home school, and ended up having every offer in the country. I um, had the ability to go to school wherever. I ended up going to Georgia um, I would say my biggest high was actually being able to get a full scholarship, not only for myself, but my oldest brother. Um, and he was able to play football with me at the University of Georgia. And, and that was just a surreal moment for um, you know my entire family. I knew that my mom wasn't going to be able to pay for school for me or for him. And um, I got to play football with my brother um, at a high level. So it was pretty cool for me. That's the biggest one. Well, for myself, um, a lot of times we talk about role models, having different people to follow. I was very fortunate to have a, an older brother um, that led the way. Uh, he played sports. Uh, he was a great student and was able to give me a kind of a blueprint of what it looks like uh, to be successful and be able to kind of follow that path. I was more of um, a late bloomer football wise. I didn't play tackle football until I was in high, uh, high school. Um, I'm from LA. We played uh, flag ball, but it was kind of like street ball. So I felt like I was ready. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was ready for put some pads on. So we played a little rough flag, but at the same time, um, didn't really put the plat pads on in a, in that kind of constructive way into high school. And one of the things that really, uh, that I gravitated to and really, uh, learned, especially from my mentor slash my older brother, uh, he, he taught me what the essence of being a student athlete, what that really meant. Um, understanding that a lot of times as athletes, you know, you know, you want to play or what have you, uh, but was held accountable, um, you know, by, uh, um, uh, you know, by our leadership, the principals of the school, uh, our school, you know, we had a, a colonel, uh, Colonel Hughes, he was a, a retired colonel in the U.S. Army was our principal. So you can imagine the discipline <laughs> that that he was, you know, a, a big gentleman, six, five. Um, uh, imposing figure, obviously, for a high school kid or what have you, bald head, <laughs> walking down the hall. So so that was a good starting point for me and being able to, get, to to be able to embrace that and have that and have somebody to follow. And uh, obviously, um, having the opportunity to get uh, a scholarship and be able to take that burden off the parent, off my parents, because in a lot of cases, you never know what route that you may go or what path that you may find uh, uh when you're not when you don't have the opportunity or don't take advantage of some opportunity so uh that was um uh very special to me to be able to take that burden off my parents and still be able to uh follow a path and not have to put any burden on them along the way well football for me started as a young age uh we started with tackle the man with the ball 
And then we worked our way to touchdown Kings to where, you know, we play from one driveway to the next. So you could fall on concrete and get hit, but it was part of the game. You know, you just sort of learn how to fall and sort of fall off the edge. So we started with touchdown Kings and sort of grew from there. Um, one of the, I think the biggest turning points within where I was trying to get my path to go was when we won a state championship as a group. And when you're on a state championship team, you try to figure out, you know, what's going to happen next? How's your life going to change? What's going to be new? Um, and the greatest thing about it is that we used to push each other back and forth to make ourselves better. And so that became our challenging point of how could we be the best we could be in, in, in between. And we had this saying in our school because I grew up in Lawton, Oklahoma, which is an army base, Fort Sill. I was born in Fort Riley. And uh, so we learned the the actual, you know, the Native American places in Oklahoma before we learned the map. And so we took a Sioux word that called Hantayo, and it means clear the way. And so we used to use that as our mantra. And that sort of built me up to where I wanted to do something different and try to be as good as I could be. And just being around that sort of created this love for each other of how do you be the best person you can be and that's sort of how it built to start with me with football the love of the game and being a part of it now I was always the fat kid so I enjoyed it so I, it was a good thing so only time I got to touch the ball was touchdown king so that was probably my highlight of football because all the other times I'm pushing people around but you know it's the, the simple fact of doing something that's unique but also changing the pathways of life because I got an opportunity to play at a great university, but then get an opportunity to play at the next level, which is something that was really unique within itself. And setting that path was those coaches and those mentors and those people that were around us that, that sort of gave us that opportunity of saying, you can do it. You can be a part of this. You can be bigger than what it is. And I think that's what made it so unique and special within itself. And that's why I love the game because it brings all aspects of people out and whether you hate a team or love a team, it's the simple fact that they push your butts, they make it happen and it changes your mentality. And that's what makes it unique. And it makes you fight harder some days. And that's what you really love about it, especially when you're getting into that point. It's, it's interesting. We grew up loving football and wanting to win and be the best player, but not one of those gentlemen just said that that was the high. This man owns a gold jacket, and he spoke about camaraderie and teamwork and service. And, and we, to a man, we heard that from every one of them. His dad signing the NIL deal, that, that was good enough. It wasn't catching the winning pass. So that's that was really interesting to me. I thought we were gonna hear one story when I just went and you know had a great game. So I would just ponder what you make of what's in these men's head with that kind of response. So I'd also I'd like to come back this way, Will, and just ask you. Okay, the cheering has stopped for you and I. So what does that feel like, and what are you doing right now to deal with? really the pain of transition well it makes you feel old to start with <laughs> but beyond being old um you know i say you're forever transferring you're always changing you're always doing something new and as long as you understand that you can always be as good as you want to be um so i've always got an opportunity to transition and change other people's lives and so there's other ways to do it whether it's in business or whether it's in the foundation work that you do um, it gives you that next opportunity, opportunity and that next goal. And to me, I think that's what you build upon is how do you affect the next person's life if you have the opportunity to. And to me, that's where this sort of fits with what I like to do is building foundations. And if you build the right foundations, everything else will grow from it. And, and that's what's really important to me. Well, as far as uh, the way I look at it, as far as like when you when you're playing, you know, I, I, I always played every year like it was my last year. So when you say transition, one thing about sports, you know, NFL, obviously not for long, you never know when that end is going to be. You know, obviously everybody want to play 10 years, 20 years, or whatever the case may be. But at the same time, no one actually knows when the plug is going to be pulled. It could be by a team. It could be by injury. It could be by fate. Anything can happen. So you never know when that time ha uh, is going to happen. So for me, every year, if, you know, focused on, like each year was the last year, and be able to make those relationships while, you know, while you're playing, 
uh, business relationships, the connections and, and how you act, why you playing, uh, how you treat people while you're playing is going to be those same people you're going, that you're going to see when you're done playing. So you, you still have that opportunity to be able to um, to build and, and work with those individuals along the way. I was very fortunate to be able to have a transition from retirement straight into the front office. I was hired in the front office. And one of the reasons why I retired because I was offered the position in the front office. And obviously, you know, when you when you get to those double digit years, as probably Will can attest, you know, your body, you know, talks to you a little bit more. <laughs> you have conversations or had conversations with you. <laughs> and you're like, well, I'm, you know, in your mind, you, know, you want to do a couple more, what have you, whatever the case may be. But when you look at uh, longevity and when um, you want to be able to, you know, can you can you work in the front office forever and you can play maybe one or two more years? Uh, for, you know, for me, I wanted to, you know, I, you know, once you get it out your system and re really be able to uh, go into that next level, you know, business wise, uh, helping players transition. Um, and Guy had mentioned about the transition, but helping other guys transitions, he helping other guys transition helps your transition. So it kind of uh, it's kind of therapeutic in that way in that you're helping others and which in turn you're really helping yourself by helping others, which builds you up and continue to, uh, to help you along the way and be able to uh, take you to the next level. So uh, as active players right now, I don't know if the world knows, but there's a mandatory day off in pro sports and college sports, but any of these men can attest there's really never a day off. Right. And so Jonathan and Jordan on your mandatory Tuesday, maybe you have victory Monday, Jordan on your mandatory Wednesday. Just talk to the audience about what you can really do with your free time. Like, what do you do to just get healthy to play the next game or talk to your your hobbies, your passions when you're really free? As an active player, what do you do? Um, I'll say, you know, we have our days. It's Tuesday. Um, you know, you play on Sundays or sometimes you play Monday. And whatever the next day is after the game, you always come in. Um, pe most people think you get the day off, but you come in, you watch tape, um, you go over, you know, with your team, uh, with your coaches, you know, your mistakes. You know, if you win the game, you still have mistakes. There's always um, room to grow and room to build. Um, after you're up there for probably three hours, um, you know, that's just the regular time. Um, you know, what I like to do is I like to get up there early. Um, I use the facilities I get in the cold tub, the hot tub. Um, I will tell you this, after a, a game, um, you never really know how bad you feel until after you go to sleep and wake up the next day. That's the worst. And that's on every level. <laughs> um, so and it gets worse as you get older. I know that they <laughs> can tell you, you know, as them years. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, you know, I tell people I'm I'm 25 and I feel like I'm 30 already, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, but I've had I've had um, I've had multiple surgeries. So, you know, I've had like seven, you know, but, you know, those off days, man, it's not really so much of an off day as much as a, a reset day to, you know, collect your thoughts, collect yourself and to get yourself back in your routine to do it again the next week, um, because that's what you have to do. You know, you continue to play and it's like, no matter what happened that week, you have to get back to your roots, your routine. And um, I think that's the biggest part to stay in this league. You have to create a routine. You have to find what works for you. So, you know, after I do that cold tub and I'm doing everything that I've watched that I need to go over, then I get home. Um, I like to cook. So I, I cook myself a meal and then I'll rest for a little bit. And then the next day you get back up and it's, back to work uh i would say for me you know in season and off day uh not really an off day like you said it's a reset day you come in uh you watch film and and for myself my plan is just to always be proactive you know i like to get ahead of things whether that be uh prehab with my body you know what i'm saying getting dry needling uh making sure that i'm stretching you know making sure that i'm hydrating you know spending that time resting my body um watching film for the next opponent you know making sure i know uh what's coming up the next week uh, spend time doing that. Um, and then just being in the facility, you know what I'm saying, kind of making uh, relationships and, and forming camaraderie with my teammates because that's 
like paramount in the success of a football team is how you feel about your teammates and how they feel about you. Can you trust each other? So try to spend time with my teammates, um, take care of my body, uh, be proactive and preparing for the next opponent. And then I'll add one more thing. Um, you know, it's kind of a stigma, like, you know, NFL, college, whatever, you know, you just kind of go to work and go home. Um, if you want to be successful, you know, in the on the football field or really just in anything in life, you know, I think it's important that, you know, you continue to put the work in well beyond the hours that you're supposed to be there. Now, um, I know, you know, this young man does it. I do it myself. And these guys have done it and still do it. Um, you know, that's why that they're who they are. They have the accolades that they have. Um, you have to be willing to stay after. And I think that's another big thing that I, I know you do it too. And I do it. You got to stay after, you know, um, whether it's you put the work in extra at home or at the facility, I think it's just good to be around and continue to to submerge yourself into that environment because that's what it takes to be successful. There's no shortcuts. So the most interesting thing I just heard is that I asked them about passions and hobbies, but what they really said is I don't have time for my passions and hobbies. Jonathan spoke a little bit about liking to cook, but that's a necessity, right? He didn't say I cycle. He didn't say I hang out and go on dates. He, you know, so what you really heard was, how committed you have to be to be a competitive athlete in collegiate and professional sports. So Will and Al, if you had not been that committed and not made it, where would, where do you see your lives and what career path might you have chosen if football was cut off in high school or college? You know, I think if it was cut off in high school, um, I would have still tried to find a way to path to get into college. Um, I actually did vocal music from when I was kindergarten all the way through high school. So I did show choirs, jazz choirs, ensembles and all of that. So that was going to be my backup plan to get into college. Now, I'm not good enough to do it professionally, but just to get into college and get to the next thing, that was sort of my backup plan if football didn't work out. Um, you know, those are things that you have to sort of pre-plan. You sort of work your way through it and go, okay, if I can't get this way, then I'll do that. Um, but, you know, you still got to have that operation of thinking that far ahead. And to me, that was part of the thing that I was, you know, I said, oh, yeah, I didn't think about playing pros. I didn't think about this, that, and the other. Pulled out the little lore book, and I'm reading it, and it said, where will you be in four years? And I had written it down. I'll be playing in the NFL. But you never really mentally thought that you had that plan until you go back and look and see where your mindset was at that point. So that was something that I would have tried to do to get into college and try to do that. Uh, being in a military town, you might have to break down and, you know, bite the bullet and go in the military at that point. You know, so those are the, the access points that I was looking at, but it was really day to day uh, until they put the article out that said you could play Divi division one or division two football at that point. I didn't even know I could be a, uh, an athlete going to college until that, till that, until you saw it in the newspaper. Before that, my mindset was like, okay, I just need to get through tomorrow. Wow. Well, for myself, you know, I didn't, um, you know, a lot of kids will always tell you, hey, you know, I want to be a professional athlete when I grow up and I want to do all these things and, and have that vision board, so to speak. Well, I, you know, I didn't have that because at the time, you know, you know, I, I didn't, uh, sports wasn't, the path, it was more of just a fun hanging out with the guys. Uh, it was more of that. And then um, it kind of fell into, you know, you got a little talent. You, you could possibly do this or you could possibly do that. But for me, uh, especially coming out of high school, and that's why that whole student athlete piece was always strong with me, is that um, I really embraced the student athlete aspect of it uh, with the stigma and a lot of things that go with that to always fight against uh, what a teacher or other people may have perceive you to be before they got to know you. So uh, I focus more on that. And coming out of high school, uh, my goal was, um, well, in high school, my goal originally, I wanted to be an FBI agent. And um, that may seem odd to some, but that was, that's what I wanted to, you know, that's what I wanted to, uh, to do. I mean, I had uh, some mentors that were in that, uh, you know, I, you know, kind of seeing how they operate and how they work and, and, and um, the professionalism that goes with it and all those type of things. That was my path. And that's what, and that's what, and that's what I kind of studied uh, to go through, you know, the thing about it though, uh, to, to, to get into that, FBI, it's an age cutoff. So by the time you, you know, like 32, 
33. If you're not in by then, you can't get in. So it's kind of like, well, my my then when my football career obviously extended longer than uh than I than I thought. You know, that was kind of you know that wasn't on the table anymore. But that was my my goal originally was to um uh, to be a, an FBI agent, and football was kind of the uh, secondary piece that kind of turned into a, a primary piece along the way. But um but the work and all the things that you have to do with that and the commitment uh or what have you. And that discipline, uh, whether it be in the student athlete realm or the athletic realm, all those discipline and 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 traits that you learn through that carry you into your next field as well. And that's what a, a lot of guys and younger guys have to embrace that, embrace that process. So, quick history lesson: uh, Terry Bradshaw was celebrated one of the great dynasties. Uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, but many people don't know the quarterback that was better than him and in front of him. It's a guy named Joe Gillum from Tennessee State University before Doug Williams. This gentleman suffered because at that time they didn't think that the black man was cerebral enough to lead an NFL franchise. And Joe Gillum ultimately suffered from drug addiction uh, because of that. We fast forward to uh, two black quarterbacks now playing in the Super Bowl for the first time. In the middle of that, Doug Williams broke the barrier. So this, this is not a popular conversation to talk about the mental aspects of these elite athletes. But I just wonder how you guys think about Patrick Mahomes and I'm drawing a blank on other guys. Uh, don't don't tell me Jordan uh, Hurst, Jalen Hurst, right? Two phenomenal athletes, two phenomenal thinkers, and just what you guys felt when that was announced, and and just think about it in comparison to the goat, Tom Brady the best quarterback uh, in most people's opinion that ever played the game. So just we're on camera. Let's message. Let's message. What what do you guys think? Uh, I would say for me, uh, just kind of from, I'm still allowed to be, be a fan, you know what I'm saying? Cause I'm in college, you know, he's in the league, you know, they've already done it. So I'm still allowed to be a fan. Um, Just as a, as a kid, you know what I'm saying? Looking at it, it's amazing. You know, honestly, uh, I didn't really have like a crazy reaction to it because I just I felt like it was a no brainer. The two of the best players in the NFL, they should be leading teams into the Super Bowl. You know, what I'm saying I didn't even think about it being the first time that two black quarterbacks are having an opportunity to play in it. Uh, but I think that it kind of breaks that stigma that a lot of scouts and and people who watch the, the NFL um, and kind of view the quarterback position as a predominantly white position. I think that it kind of just shows that if you're qualified to do the job, then you can do the job. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what demographic you're from. It doesn't matter, you know what I'm saying, what you look like, what that says about you. It's about what you do and what you're capable of on the grass. Um, and I'm just super excited for both of them and for them to have that opportunity, and I hope they both shine. Oh, uh, man, I couldn't have said it any better than that. Um, two phenomenal athletes. Um, they have set the stage, um, you know, for everything that's to come for the Super Bowl. Um, they've worked their tail off um, year in and year out. And, you know, they've gotten the accolades and, you know, all the attributes that, you know, you would want to have in a quarterback. And um, I'm I'm glad that they're doing it on the center stage. And I'm glad that they, you know, share the same color skin as me. Um, it is a milestone. Um, you know, younger people may not know of the history of the, you know, the AFL or NFL, like, you know, how it was before and how segregated things were. And, you know, Black men didn't have the ability to showcase the talents that they very well had, you know, and, um, you know, I'm grateful to be able to play in a league where, you know, it doesn't have to come to that, you know, where we're not being prohibited from doing certain things in this league where we can go out and, and be who we are and be the best athletes we, you know, can be. And um, I, I'm all for it. I'm excited. Um, I just want a good game. I don't even, I told a guy earlier, I don't even have a team I'm going for. Um, it's just, it's, it's beautiful to see, you know, and um, I'm glad that they have set the stage and I'm excited to watch these guys make history. Well, it's obviously, you know, great having these, um, these two quarterbacks in, in this game. 
uh, we, you know, we kind of focus on, you know, the color of these guys. But when you really look at these two, the two young guys, one in, let's say, in his prime and one is kind of, you know, heading in that direction, going into his prime. And not only they're solid guys, um, not in trouble, good growth models, great endorsers for products, companies, different things like that. So it really transcends transcend just, just their talents, but their talents beyond the field is enhanced as well. So a lot of times you may have a great athlete, a great player, but you have to deal with a lot of other stuff uh, off the field. But these guys uh, are trendsetters as far as that goes. Uh, they have done a great job, continue to build on that. I was very fortunate when I came into the league, into the NFL. I've always been around black quarterbacks. Uh, Warren Moon was my quarterback my whole career for the most part. And uh, when I was in the front office, we had Steve McNair, drafted Steve McNair, um, Vince Young, um, you know, uh, Young Dobbs from Tennessee is, you know, kind of came in late this year. Uh, they drafted a quarterback. So, so you seeing it more and more, uh, what have you. So, it's great to see. It's great to have. It's great to have ownership that finally understands uh, the value of the position and the and the you know the, you know and the talent of the individual, not the color of the individual and the character of the individual. And me being a, a middle linebacker or a linebacker, um, that position was kind of like the black quarterback. They wouldn't let people uh, play my position because of the color of their skin, and. Um, uh, Will will know this. Kansas City Willie Lanier was one of the the, the first black uh, middle linebackers who, you know, who I idolized. Uh, you know, coming up as well uh, to be able to to to, to uh, break that that trend. Uh, being a Kansas City Chief, um, great uh, Hall of Fame guy, uh, great mentor. Uh, Mike Singletary uh, was before me. Uh, was able to mentor me or what uh, was what have you. So you saw guys not only be the middle linebacker, but be the quarterback on defense, uh, calling the plays, uh, having to call the plays at the line of scrimmage, you know, being the coach on the field, uh, all these type of things that uh, I embrace. I didn't take it lightly. Uh, I wanted to enhance it for the next guy behind me. I mean, you see guys, um, whether it be Ray, Ray Lewis and, and guys in different generations now that, is, you know, it's kind of commonplace, but there was a time it didn't matter what your talent level was, you weren't going to play that position. <laughs> when everybody lined up, you know, the middle linebacker and the quarterback was going to be, you know, look a certain way. And uh, being able to embrace that and be able to, um, um, you know, take that to a, a whole new level and be able to, to um, um, really understand what that really meant uh, of what the, the the people before you, the players before you went through to get to that point and have the barriers they had to had to break down and being able to understand that so that you can um, be able to keep that door open for generations to come. I'll take it to the to the level that we're going through belief and opportunity. Two simple things that I said, belief and opportunity. So you believe you can do it and you have the opportunity to do it is two lovely things that you can put together. You got to realize these young quarterbacks have not only their parents that are strong in belief, but also provided an opportunity to make them feel comfortable in their own skin to walk into a room and say, I can do this because you have a professional athlete, second generation that has seen it, been around it, and understands it. And you have a, a coach's son that he's been coaching since he was this little that's already put that in your mindset. And if you walk into the door and they give you the keys to the car, I guarantee you're going to drive it, right? And that's the key. Give them the opportunity. Give them the mindset that you can do it and you, you have the opportunity to do it and do it at a comfort level, then it'll all break through. It'll all work its way through. And I think that's something that's unique about everyone that you see. You give them that opportunity and you tell them that belief and you get them to believe in it and know that they can do it. They'll they'll run through those walls to make sure that things happen. And, and to me, that's what's really cool to see, you know, all the different positions, all the different players, all the different guys that have made those those differences 
in every sport, but also just in society, because it sort of makes that change. So just share some data. The cycle of a football career in America, it's about 1.3 boys play high school ball. It's about 70,000 play college, about 2000 jobs in the NFL. And the model is four, four, four. They fire 300,000 high school boys. They fire 15,000 college boys and they fire 500 men. And so that's the model of football. And so through that, there's a lot of car accidents. There was one study that said the average football player in a career had over 50 is the, the way their body felt. It was akin to over 50 car accidents. Uh, so as you think about your choice to compete and the dangers of that, just give us some commentary on now, now that we know what we know, uh, how you feel about this opportunity we call football anybody let me start on it i mean i'll start um i feel like this is kind of personal to me like i said i went through a bunch um i know everybody has injuries and stuff they go through um but one of the reasons why i came to speak on this panel about you know men's health and you know black men's brain health is you know, when I went through my injuries, I didn't necessarily have, you know, a panel of people to talk to. I didn't have a place to open up. So, you know, I was going through a, a healing traumatic experience, not only physically, but, you know, mentally and, and spiritually. And, um, you know, if, you know, from my perspective, the spiritual and, and mental part was far worse and far harder to, you know, come back from than the physical. Because as football players, you know, it's always, you know, you get a nick or a bruise or injury. It's, you know, just get up and, you know, put the work in to get back. And uh, we know how to do the physical. You know, we know how to lift the weights. We know how to do the rehab. We know how to show up. Um, it, it's the stuff outside of that that you have to go through, the the mental capacity to, you know, relearn how to do things that, you know, you're going to be set back first to get forward. Um, and it was just through those things that I had to learn, you know, how to rebuild myself up spiritually, how to re rebuild myself up mentally and tell myself good things to keep going, to make myself, you know, want to go through the day and not be, you know, depressed or down on myself to tell myself I'm valued. Um, and it's important. And um, like I said, that's why I came here today to kind of spread the awareness of that, to let, you know, young men, you know, before me, after me, whatever, know that it's okay to be a human. You know, you don't have to be an athlete all the time. You know, it's what we do. Um, it's a beautiful profession. I wouldn't change it for the world. You know, I love to compete. Um, I love to go out there with my brothers and, and it's a great opportunity. Like I said, there's only, you know, about 2000 NFL players. Um, you know, I'm blessed to be in that number and I wouldn't change it for the world. But I think, you know, as guys strive for this and strive for, you know, future goals and Hall of Fame jackets and, you know, front office jobs. Um, I think it's important to know the value of the mental and spiritual part of yourselves, as well as the physical. You know, men are always strong, um, but you have to be strong outside of football. You have to be strong outside of the things that you do for work. And we have to work at being vulnerable. Uh, men don't know how to necessarily be vulnerable. It took a lot for me to do that. It took other men who knew how to be vulnerable to teach me how to do that. And um, I'm grateful to have them. And I know that it's my job, it's my duty to put it forward for others. Um, so, you know, that's kind of my take on it. And that's it. Anybody else want to add to that? So uh, from, a, from a taking care of your mind and body perspective, just let's just talk about your regimen, your regime. How, how are we doing that now? Al, I know you do yoga. Uh, your your avid workout guy, but just all of you guys, how are you how are you staying healthy physically, mentally, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally? What makes you think we're healthy? <laughs> we're still working on that thing. Well, well, well. To Will's point, I think it's an ongoing process, and I think it's um you continue to build, uh, you build on that. 
um, you, you alluded to kind of what I do, that's the flexibility and, 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 and what have you helps me. I mean, as far as the joints and what have you, and, um, all the battles with will, you know, I got to still got to, you know, work all those injuries out <laughs> and do all that with, um, you know, with, with stretching and, and, and being intentional, uh, not just, you know, with the stretching, your eating, your spirituality, your faith, uh, being uh, faith-based, uh, uh, focusing on things greater than yourself. And when you focus on things greater than yourself, it centers you back uh, to being the, be the best version of yourself. And by doing so, it gives me the opportunity to, um, to, to continue to strive to, to, be, to be great. Like these, these young athletes, they strive to be the best they can be all the time, uh, each week against their opponent. Well, when they stop playing, most guys stop doing that. So you still have to, uh, you versus you, instead of you versus, you know, UCLA or, or <laughs> Pittsburgh or whoever you, you pay against. So now, is it, so now the battle goes from the opponent to yourself, and it's a constant everyday battle because you can't lie to yourself. I mean, you, I mean, you can lie to yourself, but you look in the mirror, it is what it is. And, and being able to deal with that and understand that and being able to be the best version of yourself. And you don't have to be in the, in the, in, in, in top, you know, playing like banging some, you know, you know, banging around, uh, I guess another opponent type shape, but you can still be functional and what have you. I'm sure it will every day. Somebody say, Hey, you still look like you can play. And we're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's what I left me about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ask my joints about that. See that, but they don't see what, you know, what has happened internally, um, mentally, um, you know, the brain health, all those, you know, people don't see all that, what you've been through, uh, uh, the agony, uh, in some cases, depression, uh, stress, you know, all the things that a lot of times that uh, uh, we had just talked about being vulnerable and being open up to be able to deal with those things, because a lot of times guys don't talk about those those things that make them vulnerable and, and, and kind of give them the ability to kind of work on that and go to the next level. So, so that that's pretty much my so talk. Let's let me uh, if I'm a uh, 12th grader watching the Zoom, I want to know, hey, man, are you putting honey in your yoga or are you putting peanut butter or you got some great brain pill so let's i really want you to talk a little bit you know this conference is about mental health and wellness and solutions to the challenges and then being able to advocate to the league the nca a college for that so i i really want to understand like what are you an advocate of to stay healthy specifically like what are you doing man i'm drinking a lot of water or i'm you know i'm going to see a counselor Let, let's talk a little more about that so i use you know there's an app you can use that actually helps you sleep at night it helps you wake up in the morning and i use that on a consistent basis um i am a gadget person so i use a whoop i have a whoop on this hand i got a garment on this hand to monitor your body and what your health and wellness is. As you get older, you need more monitoring. I'm telling you, something's gonna fall off. So between that and then about five years ago, I transitioned and actually became a plant-based eater. So that was something that was really, really big to basically say that you're gonna give up red meat, you're gonna give up all this other stuff. And so I went to six ounces of fish or chicken a week, but the rest of it was plant-based. And everybody's looking at you like, I can't do that. It's like, but when your health and your body tells you what to do, you have to do it. And so you've got to change those habits as you get older because your body can't absorb and do the things it needs to do. So that's the one thing you have to do is, and listen to it. As, and that's hard for most people to understand. We are not we are not able to just run through walls for the rest of our lives. Our body has to be our temple and we have to learn how to make it the best it can be. And I think everybody's body's different. Some people can do more or less, you know, like I got a friend of mine that can go out and run three miles. I'm not having it, but you know, if I can't chase it or hit it down, I don't want to do it. But there's other pieces of it that if you're trying to figure out what's best for your body, you have to figure out what to eat, how to do it the right way, and then figure out how your body feels after that. And as you get older, 
some of the things you used to eat, you're not supposed to eat anymore. You have to change that. And you have to, and it's hard to get that mental out of your head of, I can't go out and eat a steak anymore and feel the same. And, and I think those are pieces that everyone has to understand. Uh, well, 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 I was just going to say, um, first, I'm getting a steak after this. So I don't, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> It's good to be young, man. It's good to be young. Um, you know, but aside from, you know, the the physical things, um, one thing that I would recommend to the young people, um, and I practice this myself, it's not something that you have to do every single day. Um, you know, I journal. Um, I encourage, you know, everyone to to keep one, you know, man, woman, whatever, you know, just just write it down. You know, sometimes we know we feel things that you don't necessarily need to be feeling, or you know, you might need to feel them. But, you know, just write it out, you know, get it off your chest, get it off your shoulders. And, you know, I think when I write my thoughts down, it could be, you know, whether I'm feeling down, whether I'm feeling up or whether if it's just a to do list to go to the grocery store. You know, um, I feel like, you know, writing things down and crossing things off a list or just seeing it um, allows you to visualize, you know, a lot better. It allows you to feel those things that you're wanting to do or your desires. And, and um it just it just takes a, a burden off of you. You know, it's it's like, OK, well, I'm putting this in a book and I'm closing this book and I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to go and take my joy back. I'm going to take the rest of my day and I'm going to live my life the way I'm supposed to live it and not be com confined or, you know, defined by my constraints. You know, and, and I think it's a stigma around it, especially for men. Like I said earlier, you know, like, oh, you got a diary or something like that. I, man, I will get on the mountaintop and tell you, like, yeah, I got one. Like I write in it all the time, you know. But it works for me. It keeps me level headed. It keeps me in a state of, you know, grace and a state of, you know, um, gratefulness. Um, and it is, you know, just be present with yourself. Another thing I would say is, you know, meditate. Um, some people don't know how to meditate and that's OK. Um, you can meditate for one minute, five minutes, five hours. You know, um, I just say sit with your thoughts and um, feel them, you know, because we think a lot of things throughout the day and some of them are, you know, good thoughts. Some of them are bad, but just allow yourself to feel it. I don't think we feel enough, you know, so that's what I have for the young people. And uh, like everybody get a journal here if you don't have one already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say for me, you know, outside of journaling, I do that as well. Uh, just having a team has been what works for me just for all of it. Uh, as far as the mental aspect of things, having somebody to talk to is is huge. And if you're not blessed enough to have somebody to talk to right now, um, I think that journaling is amazing. You know, it's something that helps you get your thoughts down. But just having an outlet period, somewhere that you can go and, and talk about the things that you're dealing with, whether that be writing down or speaking them. Um, and then on the, the physical side of things, uh, having a team that, you know what I'm saying, knows what they're doing. I don't know how to do acupuncture. I don't know how to do dry needling. I don't know, you know, <laughs> how my body is connected for real. So, but I have people that do, I know somebody that can tell me, Oh, your hamstrings are tight because your glutes are tight or your connect chain isn't in line or your hips aren't in line. Um, and, and those things just allow me to, to stay healthy enough to play ball. Um, and then having people around me that'll check me when I'm wrong, doing things that aren't good for myself and having people to talk to whenever I'm not feeling right mentally, uh, definitely helped me uh, stay well in both of those areas. I got, I got one more thing, guys. Sorry. Um, I, I feel like I got to say this because um, we're talking about, you know, speaking and opening up. Um, I just want to say this for the people that are receiving on the receiving end, you know, if a kid, a, a adult or whatever, you know, someone comes to open up to you or speak to you. I feel like we have to be better, you know, as a, a human race, as listeners. Um, I feel like we partially, you know, hear people and we don't understand how they're really feeling. Um, I think that we have to do better as men to be a safe place for other men to be able to come and talk to somebody because I feel like that's why we don't do it. We feel, you know, a lot of things, but we don't feel like there's a safe place to go and put those emotions. Um, so I feel like, you know, that's a big aspect of it because no one wants to talk to somebody who's not going to listen or who doesn't understand them. So I feel like that's the basis of it. That's the foundation of, you know, mental health and, 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 and growing together because it's not meant for us to do it alone. I don't think we were put on this earth to move or do things by ourselves. I think you're here for a greater purpose. And um, I know I'm here for a greater purpose. I know everything that I do is for far beyond me. So I try to strive and, and make it that way and live that way. And I want to be a safe place for other people. But I think other people have to instill it in themselves, that energy to become that for others. Josh. 
if if you're close to me, you can see I'm I'm actually crying right now. And Jonathan just touched an emotion in me around the needed maturity of young black men. He has it. It's clear, right? And but he's gone through something. And so if you just Google, you're gonna see some things that the world, the mass media tried to do to a child, a kid, a young active athlete trying to do his thing, made some youthful mistakes that every one of us here made, right? In some form or fashion, just youth, youthful experiences. So, you know, we didn't have to, I didn't have to ask you to clap. You saw it. So, I, Jonathan, I, I really want to just say as an active player, where you are, man, you can, you can lead a nation with that, with that mindset that we're hearing today. So I'm, I'm thankful to just learn from you and experience you, brother. I appreciate yeah. that, brother. Thank you. So one thing I heard from each of these gentlemen is a, a reference to spirituality and connecting to something higher. And so uh, a part of this conversation that it's hard to normalize in academia, it's hard to operationalize in sport, uh, it's just something we should be considering. So, Dr. Turn, I, that's that's. I mean, I'm hearing that on this panel, and I think we should try to find a way through this conference to help the industry grow. Uh, I have a model that I try to give all athletes about their own personal development, and it's it's just an acronym P I E S, uh, but pies with another S. So, if you just imagine a blank line, you write your name in it. My name is Guy. The first S is for spiritual growth. And the PIES is physical, intellectual, emotional, and social growth. If you set goals around that, and really you're hearing these men say, we journal, I write stuff down. I guarantee you some of that is in there. Uh, have any of you all had been concussed, been diagnosed, had any head injuries that you care to share? I would say I've had um, one like real concussion. I knew I had a concussion and it wasn't like in the NFL at all. Um, I was actually, I was in high school. I was actually at my private school, the school that told me I would not make it in the NFL or get a scholarship offer. And um, I was playing special teams and um, I was running down on kickoff. I didn't have any reason to be running down on kickoff. I was like a fat kid too. So I have no reason why they had me doing that. And um, I ended up like colliding with this kid and I not like we, I knocked him out like completely. And um, like you would think he was the one that was like obviously hurt the worst. But um, like I came to the sideline, I thought it was normal and everything was good. And like I had tears like literally rolling down my face and like my coach was talking to me and like I was just having a regular conversation with him. And uh, he was like, no, nah, like you're crying, like you OK. And I was like, I'm good. Like, I'm, I think I'm good. And, um, you know, that was like my younger self, you know, just, hey, let's get back in the game. And it wasn't like, a, you know, like a regular cry. Like, it was like flowing. And um, a couple minutes after that, like, I completely forgot, like, where I was. And um, I, it was honestly one of the craziest moments I've ever had in my life. And um, luckily, I've never had a concussion after that. Um, I was out of football for maybe, like, four four or five weeks. Um, didn't do anything. And then when I came back after those four or five weeks, I still was, like, on, like, a protocol. Um, I was blessed to go to a private school at that time that – knew about concussions. They had the machinery to test the stuff. And um, I did all the cognitive testing. And, you know, I think that's important um, that they had that. But I also think that in today's day and age that, you know, as athletes, we have to actually go take the test serious because sometimes like it's as long as tedious and like we don't want to do it. But like it's valuable information that's detriment that's like can be detrimental to our health. You know, like if we do it or the right way or the wrong way, you know, it could be that deciding factor. So that was the only concussion I've ever had. And um, I'm blessed to not have any more. I know some people who have had five and six and um, it, it takes a toll on the body, you know, and, and it's it's not anything easy to go through because you never know, like, when you're fully going to be better. So back in my day, I did have a concussion once in high school. Um, my coach pulled me out. He actually asked me a couple of plays and, you know, I thought I gave him the right answer. Um, but he pulled me out. I, at that point, we didn't have all the, the different tests. It was more or less give you smell and salt. And you can go back in. 
but he did set me out that week. So I set out a week and then I came back and then I've really never had a concussion since then. So, you know, it's the difference of era of what era you're in, how much knowledge base you have and where you're trying to go and what you try to figure out. And I think that's one thing about it. You have to be patient and let it get back to a hundred percent, even if you don't choose to come back, but it's just a simple fact. It's got to be back at your own comfort level and not necessarily what a someone else is telling you how you feel. And I think as athletes, it's hard to be that person. It's hard to go and go, I'm not ready yet. Uh, because we've been told since day one, put some dirt on it, go back out. You're okay. You know, those kind of things. And it's hard to be that athlete to say, no, I'm not ready, coach. I need to sit out until I get a chance to really feel comfortable being back on the field again. So the one of the biggest challenges is that when Will and I were playing in the NFL, um, an average big guy, right, probably ran a 4-9, four, 4-8, four, right? Yeah. Now the average big guy, Runs a four six, so he's moving faster. So if you can just imagine the evolution of the game, these bigger and stronger and faster and more trained men that started, they're just having collisions, and that's the biggest challenge of the sport we all love. Just the collisions of it's physics, right? So I want to ask you guys a, a sort of a double question: What? Why do you think that? Uh, talking about this is important and why do you think black men more black men aren't involved in conversations and research about physical but specifically mental health uh i, I would say uh talking about this is important just to bring awareness to it because it is a real issue it is something that affects athletes after they're done playing ball you see you know really sad stories about guys you know they finish playing ball and uh, spiral into depression and end up in, in their own, you know, in some cases uh, because of CTE and, and and things that come from playing ball. So it's, it's just so important to to bring awareness to the issue. Um, and I think that there's a stigma around talking about, you know, head injuries or, or talking about uh, mental health or anything like that. Like it's like it's the not tough thing to do. There's actually a story of my dad when he was playing ball. Uh, he hit a guy. They both went to sleep. Uh, my dad got up and he was like, did I get up first? Like, did I win? Because he thought that getting up first from being unconscious was like a win or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So uh, it's just, there's just a stigma around it that, it that it makes you, I guess, weak to speak about it or, uh, you know what I'm saying? It's not it's not the tough thing to do, you know what I'm saying, to, to speak about it in that way. But I think bringing awareness to it is, is paramount. It's super important because uh, you don't know where you're going to be down the line. You don't know. I don't know what my brain is going to be like 20 years from now playing ball. You know what I'm saying? So it's just so important to be as progressive as we can and proactive as we can about uh, furthering like awareness and research on it. I kind of just put it in kind of like layman's terms, how I see it. I mean, like no one, like he said, there's a stigma around it. That's very true. And like, I know like no one wants to be known as like the guy who's not okay or like the guy that's crazy or something like that. You know, that's just what it is or not tough. And, um, that's in itself just crazy to me, you know, um, but people don't know, you know, I think when people don't have the knowledge to, you know, honestly understand the information, they just receive it however they may, you know, or, or they get it from another source or they get it from something else. But, you know, the more you gain knowledge on the subject matter, the more you can kind of, you know, give insight to other people and insight to, you know, the people around you or the people in your profession. So I think that's, you know, important for us to come on here to learn things just you know how you guys are learning from us you know and for us to take it back to the locker room for us to take it back to our former players that we've played with and you know just make sure you know hey like it's okay like you're not crazy you're a normal human being people that don't play football go through this in their normal day lives like they're human um and i think that we have to begin to just humanize you know mental health like regardless if you're an athlete or not you know we don't have to be wear the armor we have on all the time, you know, just be yourself, you know, be you, be vulnerable, be okay. If you're okay, you know, be hurt if you're hurt, um, but just be it. And um, just find ways and people to talk to, to get you through those seasons. Well, I feel like, you know, humanizing it and, and understanding it is the key, you know, obviously forms like this and the educational aspect of it 
is very huge, just like with anything else. Um, uh, a lot of times athletes are in their own world, so to speak, that they're sheltered. Um, you know, people can't just, you know, come around. They have gates around facilities, you know, um, practices. Um, you really can't get, you know, get to a lot of different individuals. But trying to get the information at an earlier age, I, I, I think a lot of times now, when someone has a problem or someone acts out or does something, um, whether it be wrong or criminal or something, something happened, then, oh, well, he had this or he had that. Well, let's find some help. But I feel like we should be more proactive on the front end uh, as far as evaluating individuals, understanding where they're at, meeting, meeting them where they're at, and being able to implement and help help them in their early stages to where it doesn't get bad. I, th I think the reactive state that uh, we're in, not just on the athletic side, but in the world side, uh, puts us at a disadvantage, uh, you know, when we're out there as far as educating individuals. But the education is the key. Uh, this is huge, obviously. I would like to have more evaluations for athletes. This is me personally. I think there should be, uh, you know, when we talk concussion, we have mentioned about the concussion piece. Well, a lot of times the word wasn't really, you got a concussion, you got dinged, you got this, it was other words. It wasn't like concussion. It was like, you got knocked out, you know, whatever. <laughs> or, you know, they'll say different things uh, that, that didn't connotate to concussion because it was like, oh, you know, you're okay, you know, and you can go back out there. I think now uh, it's more awareness guys are coming out about whether it be depression, mental health, uh, different things that they're dealing with. And big name individuals are starting to speak out and saying that their, their struggles, which are bringing more light to it, but I, it doesn't just happen in the pros. You know, guys have issues, you know, coming up high school nowadays, you know, whether it be, you know, these mass shootings, killings, you know, different things happen. You don't know what's going on with people's brains that are causing these, these issues. So a lot of times um, I would like to see even with athletes to at least have a baseline. Like when you, if you come in and play sports, have a testing to kind of see where you're at. So if something happened down the line, you can kind of compare it to where you were and where you're going and be able to uh, have a, uh, a baseline assessment of kind of what you're dealing with and being more proactive with it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so we'll, uh, I'll try to uh, say one kind of inclusive comment about what I think uh, and and I want to ask the first question and then we'll throw it out. Um, what would you tell the governing bodies they need to do to help football players? So if you're talking to the, you know, the state high school association or the NCAA or the big 12 or the NFL, what, what would you say to them? And then the next, the person that wants to ask a question, are we, we already mic'd up and ready to go? Okay, perfect. Yes, what, what message would you send to the if you could sit with Roger Goodell or Kevin Warren, the commissioner of the Big Ten is now leaving. But uh, when you were playing college football, the commissioner of the SEC, Sankey, about this issue, this topic. Um, I'll say this. Um, I was grateful at Georgia to have a staff, a coaching staff who basically saved my life. Um, if you type my name in. You know, on Google, you'll see a crazy story. That was me. Uh, still is me. I don't take anything from that. Um, I, on the grander scale, I know that most universities don't have what I was able to to get. Um, so I think that as they put men in these positions to lead young men to become real men, um, you have to make sure that they have the backgrounds. They have been vetted. They have had not just, you know, the, you know, the regular, you know, accolades, the the academics or whatever, but also the history, you know, also the experience, Um, you know, not necessarily saying just good things. They have to have gone through things, resilient things. And, you know, they have to have shown that they have overcome adversity over and over again, because whether the truth of the matter is, you know, as men and especially men in, in, in the athletic world, you're going to have to become, overcome adversity many times over. You're going to have one thing and it's going to happen. You're going to feel a certain way. You're going to be down. You're going to have to overcome it. There's going to be the next thing that gets put on your plate. and You are gonna have to overcome it. That's life. You know, you're going to have to overcome obstacles. But um, I say that they have to get men who really know how to lead men. 
in those positions. And I think that's the key. Um, I would sit down in front of Roger um, in the NFL and say that as well. Question. Sir, you have a mic, you want a question? Oh, anybody have a question? Think about gosh, when I think about um, post college uh, football athletes on scholarship and not going pro uh, in that space of identity and who am I and what do I do and feeling lost, right? And maybe having health issues or have had injuries that took them out and not going professional. Corey Booker is a legislator who has the athletes' rights, college athletes' rights, and the big part of that is health insurance. And I think there's no money for them to address some of these extensive health needs that they have uh, just to keep the bodies going or keep the rehab going. Because once you leave, the scholarship's gone and so is access to the doctor and medical. And I think it'd be really important to have big conversations about including maybe health insurance for a year or two, especially after college, depending on what situations happen during college. Um, and I don't know if anybody's following that with Cory Booker, but the legislation is there as of August 2022, and there's five senators who support it, so it's worth looking at. Cory Booker is the Democratic Black Senator from New Jersey. Yeah. So, so I, I'll how, address that and ask one of you guys. So one thing in the NFL, after you play for a period, they cut your health benefits off, right? Yeah, you have five years. Yeah. After you, if you are a vet veteran, you yeah. get five years of paid insurance. Yeah. Then after that, you have to pay on your own. But if you also have that five years, you have a HRA or HSA that also pays for a couple of more years after that. Yeah. So, but if you think about the trauma, they cut theirs off at five. She brought up that the college athlete, I mean, when I was in college, what I, when I got injured in football, my mom paid for some of the things through her insurance, right? Uh, and so if we're talking about trying to make an impact, it's the CFP is about to make a billion dollars when they extend that game. So what I hear you're, you saying is maybe they should put some of that money towards health and, and welfare. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts about just the bucket of money that will come down from the CFP and the, the billions of dollars that NFL is making. No, no, I agree with it totally. Um, it's a problem. Uh, a lot of athletes have, um, you know, guys have been paralyzed in college or, or individuals have been, you know, have long-term injuries that take care well beyond college. And a lot of times, uh, it's like you said, it's on the parents and depending on where you, what your background and, and your parents' situation, you know, there's nothing there. And then, you know, you, that's where you hear about the GoFundMe's and all this stuff that that's happened. But when you have a billion dollar business with these colleges that make so much money off these athletes, uh, coaches, you know, the coaches, the money and, and um, the university, all the sports. I mean, they make so much money to where not just football, but basketball, you know, volleyball, uh, you know, girls basketball, whatever the case is, all, you know, all these athletes, you know, they leave with a, a torn up knee or whatever. And that knee, you know, bothers them in their next uh, form of life. They can't do certain jobs, maybe because of the fact physically they can't do those type of jobs. So it's it's more than just that actual event at the university. Once that happens, uh, it carries on for the rest of their lives and something. Um, that would be the conversation that I would like to have or change um, because it starts in college, because if it starts there, I think it could trickle up as opposed to trickle down. Any other questions? It's two right here. Work in research, and I wanted to know how involved is the NFL in clinical trials? Are you informed? Are you involved? Have anyone informed? Even those, I think we had a young lady earlier that talked about actually looking at longitudinal studies from the, I don't know if you were here earlier, from Pop Warner all the way to the uh, university, then to pro football. And that would be a great opportunity because we do not have um, research in, as it relates to that. So how involved and how informed is NFL or any area involved in clinical trials or research? So, so, 
Let me nope. go frame it. Has yes. anyone ever received a letter from their high school, college, or pro team, league, governing body to say join a clinical trial? Um, I have. I've done the concussion one. I've done the concussion survey and the like. They email you. You do like an hour long um, questionnaire and stuff like that. I've done that, and I think it's from. It was actually from college. I think they still track you from high school to college to the league. So I did that just for you know my own, you know, wanting to know the knowledge. I want to, you know, kind of gain the experience of it. So yeah. that's the that, only one I've that done. That question was more. asked because I hear you, you want to give, you want to give back to them, but that probably would be the best way to get involved in clinical trials so that we can see as researchers what obviously are concerns that relate to our younger athletes. Will has a great working relationship with the NFL. Of course, he's a Hall of Famer. He's an NFL legend, and he he probably would be most informed. Al also serves on the NFL Player Care Foundation. So speak about any of the conversations you guys are, are aware of. That's one. No, I don't I don't think we get those numbers as far as from what we do within our jobs with the legends and the player care and that kind of stuff. But we do know that there are some underlying studies that are being done, uh, but we don't get that information ourselves. Yes, we. <laughs> Next question over here. Yeah, one up front, one in the back. Okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, Laura McReynolds, first year, uh, our first cohort, Blackman's Brain Health Scholar. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, you spoke about being like the quarterback on the defensive side of the field. And I wanted to ask you guys in terms of memorizing plays, memorizing formations, having to adapt on the fly, are there any kind of cognitive or intellectual skills that you developed in order to play the game at the highest level uh, that help you now off of the field? Well. Uh, for me, uh, unlike a lot, unlike, in my opinion, a lot of guys nowadays, a lot it was put on us as players as far as the play calling and what have you. Um, um, I had different um, defensive coordinators, uh, but the one uh, this, this most noticeable, most noticeable was Brooke, Buddy Ryan, and we ran a 46 defense. And obviously with that, you have to make all the calls on the field. So really, it takes all the pressure off the coach. So it puts everything on the player uh, to do all the study, all the work, which in turns, if it's a bad call, well, your quarterback will get you out of the bad call and put you in a good call. So um, it trained me because like on Tuesdays, whenever I had a day off, when I was my first day, I get the game plan on the day off. So when Wednesday come, when everybody comes in, I'm already ahead of the game so I can get my other 10 guys you know, teach them and, and kind of get them under, you know, understanding what the, you know, what the plan was going into the week. So having that extra pre preparation, because a lot of guys always say, I don't know how you, you know, how you remember all that stuff and this, or this or, you know, but it was kind of like repetition, you know, obviously it's, you know, repetition is a key. And that's kind of like with me, uh, everyone learns differently, but me, me is by, you know, repetition. You know, if I see it, the more I see it, the more I see it, the more I see it. Some people might say, well, you know, you've been going over and going over and going over it, but I, I kind of feel like with repetition puts you in a situation where you can uh, uh, um, uh, regurgitate it and put, put it back out quicker. And, uh, and when the game, you have what, less than one second to, to figure out what to do and what to say. I mean, you know, what to say, you don't have time. You can't, you know, you got, the office alignment and everybody coming out the huddle, you can't be studying and, 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 and hesitating because you got 10 other guys um, relying on you and you have an offense that knows what they're doing. We see they have the advantage. They know what they're doing. They know their play. Well, we have the disadvantage. We have to react to what they're doing. So whatever we can do to kind of, to, you know, close that gap of, of knowledge, they are part of um, building defense is, is, is tearing down. And um, and to do that, you have to be a step ahead, so that so that they're not as far as ahead of uh, ahead of you, uh, because of the fact they know what they what they're going to do. We have to react to what the, what what they do. But the repetition, I mean, repetition was always great for me, and um, as far as getting over the hump with that, and, and that carries over. And on the other Thank side, you. we would build in the spatial awareness. The simple fact of what I would do is study film and watch where he would line up his footwork where he would go his depth 
even to how deep he stood, I would be able to tell the difference. Uh, if he leans right, leans left, or whomever was around, I could actually tell. So if I'm looking directly straight, which I have to because I got a 300 pounder in front of me, I can actually watch this person here, that person here, and that person here, and they will tell me what he's going to do. So that's just natural of what you flow into. But also I would go to the other level of actually I would go and write, rewrite the whole playbook because I need to know if my guy is going in motion, he knows where he's going to stop, but I need to know where he's going to stop and I need to know where that guy goes so that they fit. And so we sort of fit within these different categories. So you've got to learn different elements as you're going through. And then someday you might be a guard and then they might throw you at tackle in a game. So those different things might happen too. So those are different aspects of how you can take your thought pattern and grow it. And then you get a new coach. Then you got to learn a whole new offense. Then you got all different nomenclature, new words, new things, new that. One guy caught, they call the same play five different ways. And you have to now sort of regurgitate that and put it into your Rolodex and then relate it to the last offense. So those are things that sort of come when you go down to that to that micro level of knowing all the little nuances of who's around you, who's doing what and everything else. So it's, it's pretty interesting once you get down that far in the weeds or you can watch a game and see, Oh, well, that cornerback got hurt last game or this, this, uh, this last play, they're going to do this next, or you can see a seam route or you can see certain things. So it sort of brings your mind back to what you're looking for and how you're looking at it. But then you got to study your own self and know where your weaknesses are. And build that into that too. So yes, we do. So we, so we just we just got our. Uh, we can't go to overtime. The game is over. All right. We just got the red light. She we wrap it up. So I'd like to just make this last closing comment. Uh, you you academics, I know you know all about all the research, but Gardner done some research on multiple intelligences, and uh, if you know that wheel, you can see you already just saw how intelligent a football player is. And, and we owe it to them to protect their intellect, their mental health, and all of their gifts that they give to us. So give it up for Jordan, Jonathan, Al, and Will. Thank you for, thank you for engaging. Thank you. Thanks so much to the Players uh, Network event for this wonderful panel. Uh, so this is going to conclude the uh, the sports spotlight. Hold on, we're going to get a picture of our wonderful panel really quickly. You got it. Okay, great. And uh, then uh, Dr. Turner and I are going to be doing the raffle. We have eight uh, items here. You need to be here in person. So get out your raffle tickets. It's happening. I want to see some raffle tickets. Giving away eight items, I believe four books, four bottles. Oh, yeah, we can take pictures with the uh, players first. And then we're going to have closing remarks by Dr. Bird to uh, close out the session. So please just hold on one tight, get your, get your tickets.
Okay, here we go. Raffle time. Thank you, Al. Uh, no, thank you, Mark. Okay, so we're raffling off four of Dr. Turner's books. They're going to be signed. No, well, they're not. No, even, no, I know they're yeah, going to be sent, yeah, signed and signed, sent. Signed, yes, yeah. Exactly. So those four books. Oh yes, estoy hablando. Come on. <laughs> Okay, when I get tired, the Spanish comes out. ESL, y'all. Um, okay, so uh, we're, we have four books from the amazing Dr. Turner. They will be signed and they will be sent directly to you. So I need somebody from Robert's team to be here. Kate Garcia is in the back. So please go to her with your winning ticket and we will uh, make sure you get this signed book. It's going to be a collector's item. Okay, so here's, Robert, do you want to do the honors or shall I? You can okay. All I'll right. Hold, I'll hold. Okay. All right. He's, he's gonna uh, hold hold the numbers. First one. Last four numbers. La okay. Last four numbers. I'm only doing the last four numbers. Is everybody focused up? I know we're ready to get our drink on, food on. Okay. Here we go. Last four numbers. Four six two one. Four six two one. Anybody? Okay. All right. Going once, going twice. Next one. Just the last four, right? Just the last okay. four. Four, five, seven, two. Four, five, seven. Two. Yay! We got a player here, a former player. All right, all right. Yeah, so this okay. is a book. So what you have to do, Kate. Kate. You're gonna see her, give her information, and yeah, we'll sign it, we'll mail it to you. Thank you. All right, big round of applause, our first book. Thank you. Next, we have 